Random House Audiobooks presents Dragonlance Legends, Volume 2, War of the Twins by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman Read for you by Peter McNichol The dark waters of time swirled about the Archmage's black robes, carrying him and those with him forward through the years. The sky rained fire, the mountain fell upon the city of Istar, plunging it down into the depths of the ground. The sea waters rushed in to fill the void, the great temple, where the king priest was still waiting for the gods to grant him his demands, vanished from the face of the world. But there were many on Ancelon who envied the inhabitants of Istar. For them, at least, death had come swiftly. For those who survived the immediate destruction on Ancelon, death came more slowly, in hideous aspect. Starvation, disease, murder, war. A hoarse, bellowing yell of fear and horror shattered Crisania's sleep. Desperately, she forced herself to remember. There had been singing stones, a chanting voice, Raceland's voice, his arms around her, then the swift, vast darkness. Raceland, Crisania called, struggling to her feet. Her hand went to the medallion of Paladine around her neck. The god's blessing flowed through her. Light, she prayed as the yell came again. Karaman's yell. The light of the god parted the darkness, bringing two figures into shockingly stark relief. One, in black robes, lay still and silent on the floor. Standing above that unmoving figure was a huge man wearing blood-stained armor and an iron collar bolted around his neck. He stared into the darkness, his hands outstretched, his face white with terror. The medallion slipped from Cassania's hand as she recognized the body at the feet of the warrior. Raceland! She knelt beside the mage. What have you done? She cried to Caramon. Crisania! Taking a step toward her, Caramon fell over his brother's legs and plunged headlong to the floor. Blessed Paladine, you are blind! Reaching out, she helped the sobbing Caramon to his feet. Caramon, is Raceland dead? Raceland? Caramon's face grew alarmed. No, I didn't kill him. How could I? The last thing I heard was you crying out to Paladine. Then everything went dark. The sword fell from my hand. Crisania felt for Raceland's life beat. He's alive, but but then what's wrong with him? Caramon shrugged, exhausted by his spell casting. I've seen him like that before. He just has to rest. Lady Crisania, can you heal me? I I'm afraid not. It must have been my spell that blinded you. The big warrior had been intent on killing his twin, and her too, if she got in his way. I'm sorry. I was desperate. Don't worry, though. The spell will wear off in time. Caramon sighed. Is there a light in this room? Yes, I have the medallion. Where are we? Describe it. Crisania held the glowing medallion high. She choked seeing a dark shape suddenly skitter away from her light. Rats, she said. If all we have to fear are rats, lady, we may count ourselves lucky. Then Crisania remembered the shout of sheer terror that had awakened her. Swiftly, she glanced about. What is it, Caramon? You must have heard or sensed something, yet... Sensed, yes. I sensed it. There are things in this place, Crisania. Horrible things. I can feel them watching us. I can feel their hatred. Can't you feel it too? Crisania caught her breath. I know where we are, Caramon. The Dark Tower. The Tower of High Sorcery at Palanthus. Where Raceland lives? Caramon looked relieved. Yes. No. It's the same room I was in. His study. But it, it looks like no one's lived here for maybe a hundred years or more. And... Caramon, that's it! He said he was taking me to a time when there were no clerics. That must be after the cataclysm and before the war. 
Before... Before he returned to claim this tower as his own, Caramon said grimly. And that means the curse is still upon the tower. We are in the one place on Kryn where evil reigns supreme. Chrysania suddenly saw pale faces appear outside the circle of light, disembodied heads staring at her, their mouths opening wide in anticipation of warm living blood. Caramon, I can see the evil guardians now. She shrank close to the big man. I felt their hands on me, Caramon said. Their touch froze my skin. That was when you heard me yell. But what keeps them from attacking? You, Lady Crisania, you are a cleric of Paladine. These are creatures spawned of evil. They do not have power to harm you. Crisania looked at the medallion in her hands. Its light seemed to dim. I am a cleric, true. But my faith is imperfect. They sense my doubts. My light is failing, Caramon. The warrior clenched his fist. I've no weapon. I can't see. Hush, Caramon. They grow stronger when you talk like that. Perhaps they feed off fear. We've got to wake up Raislin. Crisania shook the mage gently. There was no response. Would they kill him, she wondered. After all, he didn't exist in this time. The master of past and present they were waiting for had not yet returned to claim his property. This tower. Or had he? Keeping her eyes on the undead, she whispered, Fiston Dantalus. Yes, Caramon cried, understanding. They recognize that name. What's happening? I feel a change. They're looking at him now. Caramon rose to a half crouch. Get that light away from him. Let them see him as he exists in their darkness. No, once the light's gone, they'll devour him. It's our only chance! Lunging for Crisania blindly, Caramon caught her off guard. He yanked her away from Raislin, hurling her to the floor. Then he fell across her. Caramon, they'll kill him! Oh, Paladine, help me! Crisania prayed. Nothing happened. She could only watch as the pale figures surrounded Raislin. One laid its cold hands on his body. Raislin screamed, his body jerking in spasms of agony. In her struggle to break free, Crisania dropped the medallion. Its light vanished, plunging them into complete darkness. A face came near Crisania's. She glanced up quickly, thinking it was Caramon. It wasn't. A disembodied head floated near her. No! Fleshless hands grasped her arms. Bloodless lips gaped, eager for warmth. Crisania tried to pray, but her soul was being sucked from her body, chanting words of magic. Light exploded around her. The head vanished with a shriek. Shirak! A soft glow lit the room. Crisania sat up. Raislin! The mage lay on his back, breathing heavily. One hand rested on the staff of Magius. Light radiated from the crystal ball, clutched in the golden dragon's claw atop the staff. Crisania crawled toward Raislin. He reached up and drew her to him. Embracing her, he stroked her soft black hair. The strange warmth of his body drove away the chill. Don't be afraid. They will not harm us. They have recognized me. Then she felt his body tense, almost angrily. He pushed her away from him. Tell me what happened. I, I woke up here, Crisini faltered. I heard Caramon shout. My brother. So the spell brought him to. Where is he? Lifting his head, he saw his brother lying unconscious on the floor. What's the matter with him? I cast a spell. He's blind. And those those things attacked him. I'm not sure if he's still alive. We need him. You must heal him. A fit of coughing racked Raceland's frail body, weak from spell casting. Are you are you sure? He tried to murder you, Crisania. I am going to lose consciousness. You will be alone in this place of darkness. My brother can help. Water. A potion will help. Warmth. Don't leave this room. Then his eyes rolled back in his head. Crisania glanced around fearfully. Water. Warmth. How could she manage? She couldn't. Not in this chamber of evil. Raislin, she begged, grasping his frail hand as tears rolled down her cheeks. I, I can't do what you ask. I can't create water out of dust. And then she knew. My tears, she murmured.
Braving the guardians of the tower, Chrysania left the circle of light. She went to the window, ripped down the curtains, and took them to use as blankets. She prayed to Paladine to make Caraman strong again. Her prayers were granted, and the warrior fell into a peaceful, healing sleep. Then Chrysania saw a broken beaker filled with water. When she drank from it, it magically refilled itself. Feeling sure that Paladine was with her now, Chrysania curled up next to Raistlin and, covering them both with the curtain, fell asleep. The undead guardians of the tower were confused. Was this the master of past and present they'd been waiting for? Pressing their cold fingers on his body, they relived his memories through his dreams. They saw how he had gone back in time to the year before the cataclysm, how he had studied with Fiston Dantilus, disguised as one of the great mage's apprentices, how the mage had chosen Raistlin as the one whose body he would next inhabit. Fiston Dantilus had lived for centuries this way by taking the bodies of apprentices, and when he was ready to enter the future... He already had a body prepared for him, Raistlin's. But Raistlin had gotten the jump on him and come back to the past himself. In the subterranean laboratory of Fiston Dantilus, the two had battled each other, and Raistlin had emerged victorious, sucking Fiston Dantilus's life force from his body, making the great mage's essence part of himself. But Raistlin had absorbed so much of the arch mage that he no longer knew who he was, himself or Fiston Dantilus. Awakening, Raistlin warned the guardians never to touch him again, or he would turn them to dust, just as he had done to Fistandantilus. The guardians bowed and faded into the shadows. Soon, Chrysania and Caraman awoke. Caraman's sight had returned. He built a fire, and Chrysania helped Raistlin brew his hot potion, which always renewed his strength. An awkward silence fell. Chrysania returned to her own chair, trying to make some sense of what had happened. Hours ago, she had been standing in a doomed city, a city destined to die by the wrath of the gods. She had been on the verge of complete mental and physical collapse. She could admit this now, though she could not have then. How fondly she had imagined her soul to be girded round by the steel walls of her faith. Not steel she saw now with shame and regret, but ice. The ice had melted in the harsh light of truth, leaving her exposed and vulnerable. If it had not been for Raislin, she would have perished back there in Istar. Raislin, her face flushed. She'd never really believed in love, the kind of love that existed in tales told to children. To be that wrapped up in another person seemed a weakness to be avoided. Her thoughts went to the last day in Istar, when she had suddenly found herself in Raislin's arms. Her heart contracted with a swift ache of desire. But there was also a strange revulsion. Even as her body longed for his touch, something in her soul shrank away in horror. Caramon's stomach rumbled loudly. The sound was startling. Caramon blushed, and then they all began to laugh. Oh, thus do the gods remind us that we're human, Caramon said merrily. Here we are in the most horrible place, surrounded by creatures waiting eagerly to devour us. And all I can think of is how hungry I am. He turned to Raislin. How long are we going to be here? Not long. I need time to recover my strength. This lady needs time to commune with her god and renew her faith. Then we will be ready to enter the portal. At which time, my brother, you may go where you will. Chrysani felt Caramon's questioning glance. But she kept her face smooth and expressionless the Raceland's cool, casual mention of entering the dread portal, of going into the abyss and facing the Queen of Darkness, froze her heart. Will you send me home? Caramon asked his twin. If that is where you wish to go. Yes, I want to go back to my wife, to Tika. Oh, I don't know how I'll ever explain to her about Taz dying back there in Istar. Caramon... You will undoubtedly return to find Tasselhoff sitting in your kitchen, regaling Tika with one stupid story after another, having robbed you blind in the meantime. What? Listen to me, my brother. The Kender doomed himself when he disrupted Parsalian's spell. There is a very good reason for the prohibition against those of his race and the races of dwarves and gnomes traveling back in time. Since they were created by accident... These races are not within the flow of time, 
as are humans, elves and ogres. Thus the Kender could have altered time. I could not allow that to happen. Had he stopped the cataclysm as he intended, who knows what might have occurred. Perhaps we might have returned to our own time to find the Queen of Darkness reigning supreme and unchallenged since the cataclysm was sent in part to prepare the world to face her coming and give it the strength to defy her. So you murdered him, Caramon interrupted. I taught him how to use the device, and I sent him home. Caramon blinked. You did? I did. But I don't expect you to believe me, my brother. Why should you, after all? So, Tess is home, and when I go back, I'll find him. Safe and sound, and loaded down with most of your possessions. But now we must turn to more pressing matters. The time we have come forward to is about 100 years after the cataclysm. This tower has been deserted all those years, and there are none on Kryn who dare enter. Except for myself, of course. You and my brother will go into Palanthus and buy food and clothing. I could produce it with my magic, but I dare not waste any energy between now and when I... That is, Chrysania and I enter the portal... I will give you a charm to guard you, my brother. Where is this, uh, this portal? Caramon asked abruptly. In the laboratory above us, at the top of the tower. The portals were kept in the most secure place the wizards could devise, because, as you can imagine, they are extremely dangerous. It's like wizards to go tampering with what they should best leave alone, Caramon growled. Why in the name of the gods did they create a gateway to the abyss? Raceland stared at the flames. In the hunger for knowledge, many things are created. And from the beginning, the greatest creative forces on Kryn have been the three orders of wizards. The white-robed of good, the black-robed of evil, and the red-robed of neutrality. Long ago, during the Age of Dreams, the portals were constructed by the wizards of all three robes working together. The portals could not only provide movement between any of the far-flung towers of magic, but also into the realms of the gods, as an inept wizard of my own order discovered to his misfortune. Tempted by the Queen of Darkness as only she can tempt mortal men when she chooses, he used the portal to enter her realm and gain the prize she offered him nightly in his dreams. Fool! He never returned through the portal. The queen, however, did. And with her came legions of dragons. The first dragon wars, Chrysania gasped. Yes, brought upon us by one of my own kind with no self-control. One who allowed himself to be seduced. Breaking off, Raceland stared broodingly into the fire. But I never heard that, Caramon protested. According to the legends, the dragons came together. Your history is limited to bedtime tales, my brother, and just proves how little you know of dragons. They're independent creatures. Proud, self-centered, and completely incapable of coming together to coordinate any sort of war effort. No, the queen entered the world completely that time. Not just the shadow she was during our war with her. It was only through the heroism and sacrifice of the great Salamnic Knight Huma that she was driven back. The fact that he did drive her back proves that, in this world, she is vulnerable. Had there been someone capable of destroying her utterly instead of simply driving her back, then history might well have been rewritten. When I am stronger, tomorrow, I will ascend to the laboratory alone and begin my preparations. You, lady... At best, start communing with your god. Shivering, Chrysania drew her chair nearer the fire. But suddenly, Caramon was on his feet, standing before her. This is madness, lady. Let me take you from this dark place. Let Raceland challenge the gods if that's what he wants. But you don't have to go with him. Let me take you back to our time. Raceland did not speak, but his thoughts echoed in Chrysania's mind. Paladine favors you. You are his chosen you will succeed where the king priest failed. Come with me, Chrysania. This is our destiny. I am frightened, Chrysania said to Caramon, but this fear of mine is a weakness in me that I must combat. With Paladine's help, 
I will overcome it before I enter the portal with your brother. So be it, Caramon said heavily, turning away. Graceland smiled. Caramon, the markets, such as they are in these bleak times, are just opening. Here are some coins. That should be sufficient for our needs. Caramon caught the coins without thinking. Then he hesitated, staring at his brother with the same look Rosania had seen him wear in the temple at Istar. And she remembered thinking, what terrible hate, what terrible love. Finally, Caramon lowered his gaze, stuffing the money into his belt. Come here to me, Caramon, Raceland said. Why? Well, there is the matter of that iron collar around your neck from the arena back in Istar. Would you walk the streets with the mark of slavery still? And then there is the charm. Raceland spoke a soft word. The iron collar fell from Caramon's neck. I'm doing this for Crescenia, Raceland. If it were just you and me, I'd let you rot in this foul place. Would you, my brother? Would you truly have killed me back there in Istar? Raceland kissed his brother on the forehead. Caramon flinched, as though he'd been touched with a red-hot iron. Oh, I don't know. The gods help me, I don't know. With a shuddering sob, he covered his face with his hands. Raceland stroked his brother's brown, curling hair. There now, Caramon. I have given you the charm. The things of darkness cannot harm you, not so long as I am here. I will send one of them with you to protect you. No, thanks, Caramon muttered, scowling as a pair of disembodied eyes drew near. Attend him, Raceland commanded the eyes. He's under my protection. You see me? You know who I am? The eyes lowered their gaze in reverence, then fixed their cold and ghastly stare upon Caramon. Raceland's face turned grim. The guardians will guide you safely through the grove. You may have more to fear, however, once you leave it. Be wary, my brother. This city is not the beautiful, serene place it will become in our own time two hundred years from now. Today, refugees pack it, living in the streets. There are men out there who will murder you for your boots. Buy a sword, first thing, and carry it openly in your hand. Caramon walked off down the corridor, trying to ignore the glowing eyes that floated near his shoulder. Waiting until he was gone, Raceland turned to Crescenia. Unseen, he reached into one of the pockets of his black robes and drew forth a handful of fine white sand. Coming up behind her, the mage raised his hand and let the sand drift down over her dark hair. As to Sark Samarilan, Grenawi. Rosania's head drooped, her eyes closed, and she drifted into a deep, magical sleep. Raceland stared at her for long moments. Were I as other men, she would be mine. His hand lingered near her face. But I am not as other men. Letting her hair fall, he pulled the velvet curtain up around her shoulders. His hand began to tremble. I am not as other men. Abruptly walking away, he turned to the guardians. Watch over her while I'm gone. You two accompany me. He gripped the staff, spoke a word of magic, and was instantly transported to the laboratory. Graceland had not even drawn a breath when materializing out of the darkness, he was attacked. Dark shapes swirled out of the air, daring the light of the staff as bone-white fingers clutched for his throat and grasped his robes, rending the cloth. So swift and sudden was the attack that Graceland very nearly lost control. Talk to them, he commanded the two guardians with him. Tell them who I am. Fist and Dantilus, he heard them say through a roaring in his ears. Though his time has not yet come as was foretold. Weakened and dizzy, Raceland staggered to a chair and slumped down into it. Bitterly cursing himself for not being prepared for such an onslaught, he wiped blood from a jagged cut upon his face. This is your doing, my queen. You have your foothold in this world. Even now you have wakened the evil dragons. They are stealing the eggs of the good dragons. But the door remains closed. The foundation stone has been blocked by self-sacrificing love. And that was your mistake. For now, by your entry into our plane, you have made it possible for us to enter yours. 
I cannot reach you yet. You cannot reach me. But the time will come. The time will come. Raceland sat for an hour in the darkness, going over his plans. He needed two weeks of unbroken rest and study to prepare himself. That time, he would find here easily enough. Chrysania was his. She would follow him willingly, calling down the power of Paladine to assist him in opening the portal and fighting the dread guardians beyond. He had the knowledge of Fist and Dantilus, knowledge accumulated by the mage over the ages. He had his own knowledge too, plus the strength of his younger body. By the time he was ready to enter, he would be at the height of his powers, the greatest archmage who ever lived. Rising, Raceland walked about the laboratory. He noticed puzzling changes. Everything should have been exactly as it was when he would arrive 200 years from now. But a beaker, now standing intact, had been broken when he found it. A spell book, now resting on the large stone table, he had discovered on the floor. Perhaps an earthquake, he said to himself. Raising the staff, he shone its magical light ahead of him. The shadows fled the far corner of the laboratory, the corner where stood the portal, with its platinum carvings of the five dragon heads and its huge silver steel door that no key upon Crin could unlock. Raceland held the staff high and gasped. For long moments, he could only stare. Then, his scream of fury pierced the living fabric of the tower's darkness. Caramon heard the cry as he entered the door of the tower. He dropped his packages and with trembling hands lit a torch. His new sword in hand, the big warrior took the stairs two at a time. Entering the study, he saw Crisania looking round fearfully. I heard a scream, she said, rubbing her eyes. Are you all right, Lady Crisania? Yes, it wasn't me. I must have fallen asleep. It woke me. Where's Raced? Raceland. In alarm, she started to push past Caramon, but he caught hold of her. This is why you slept. He brushed the fine white sand from her hair. Sleep spell. But why, Caramon? We'll find out. Warrior, said a cold voice almost in his ear. A spectral figure materialized out of the darkness. You seek the wizard. He is above, in the laboratory. He is in need of assistance, and we have been commanded not to touch him. I'll go. Caramon said, alone. I'm coming with you, Crisania said firmly. Caramon started to argue. Then, remembering that she was a cleric of Paladine and had healing powers, he gave in. What happened to him? Caramon asked the specter as they followed it to the top of the tower. Where is Raced? Uh, uh, Fist and Dantilus, Crisania stammered. Within, the specter pointed to an open door. The sense of evil coming from within was overwhelming. But Crisania, her hand firmly clasped over the medallion of Paladine, began to walk forward. Caramon followed, his eyes scanning the darkness. Raceland lay on his side. The staff of Magius lay some distance from him, its light out. Crisania felt for the life beat in his neck. It was weak and irregular, but he lived. He is not hurt physically, the specter said. He came to this part of the laboratory as though looking for something, muttering about a portal. Then he screamed and fell to the floor, cursing in fury until he lost consciousness. Puzzled, Caramon held the torch up. I... There's nothing here. Nothing but a bare, blank wall. For days, Crisania and Caramon tended the mage in the tower. When he recovered, Raistlin went into the city of Palanthus to the great library, where the chronicles of Astinus were kept. The chronicles detailed every moment of the history of Crin. Raistlin paid a visit to Astinus, the ageless historian who had lived since the very beginning of the world and who would be there to see the end whenever it came. Raistlin asked the historian what had happened to the portal and was told that it had been removed by the mages for safekeeping and taken to the magical fortress of Zaman, 
the fortress was located in the plains of Durgoth, near Thorbardin, home of the mountain dwarves. Even now their cousins, the hill dwarves, were on their way to Thorbardin to demand shelter within the ancient mountain home of all dwarves, shelter from the evil that had consumed all of Kryn following the cataclysm. Raistlin knew that it was at Zaman that Fistandantilus had fought in the Great Dwarven War, the war in which the Archmage had met his doom. Raistlin wondered whether his soul was now forever wedded to that of Fistandantilus. Was he heading toward the same inexorable fate? Meanwhile, beyond Kryn, and outside of time itself, Tasselhoff Burfoot awoke to find himself in the strangest place imaginable. He thought he must be dead, because the last thing he'd seen before losing consciousness was the fiery mountain about to crash into the king priest's temple. The empty, barren landscape seemed to change constantly, reflecting whatever image Tass conjured up in his mind, but always twisting the image into something evil and horrible. Tass was beginning to think he didn't like the place at all, when a dark cleric materialized before him, told him he was in the abyss, and asked him what the kender was doing there. Tass had always considered himself to be a good kender, and was very upset to find out he'd landed in the abyss. He demanded to see the person in charge. The cleric proceeded to lead him directly to the Queen of Darkness. The Queen appeared to Tass in a very mild form, that of a lovely, pale lady, dressed in black. Her words echoing inside his mind, she silently ordered him to tell her his story. Tass proceeded to give the most concise account in the history of Kenderdom. Parsalian accidentally sent me back in time with my friend Caramon. We were going to kill Fist and Dantilus, only we discovered it was Raceland, so, well, we didn't. I was going to stop the cataclysm with a magical device, but Raceland made me break it. So I followed a cleric named Lady Crisania down to a laboratory beneath the Temple of Istar to find Raceland and make him fix the device. Ah, uh, the roof caved in and knocked me out. When I woke up, they'd all left me, and the cataclysm struck, and now I'm dead, and I've been sent to the abyss. Oh. Castlehoff drew a deep breath and mopped his face with the end of his top knot of hair. You are not dead, said the voice. Nor have you been sent here. You are not, in fact, supposed to be here at all. I, I, I'm not? Kenda are not allowed here. When you entered the laboratory of Fist and Dantilus, you were protected by the magical enchantment he had laid on the place. The rest of his tower was plunged far below the ground at the time the cataclysm struck. But I was able to save the temple of the king priest. When I am ready, it will return to the world as will I myself. But, but, but you won't win. I, I know, because I was, I was there. No, you are not there, for that has not happened yet. You see, Kenda, by disrupting Parsalian's spell, you have made it possible to alter time. Fist and Dantilus, or Raceland, as you know him, told you this. That was why he sent you to your death. Or so he supposed. He did not want time altered. The cataclysm was necessary to him, so that he could bring this cleric of Paladine forward to a time when he will have the only true cleric in the land. How soon you will come to regret that decision, Fist and Dantilus. Poor puny mortal! You have made a costly mistake. You are locked in your own time loop. You rush forward to your own doom. I, I don't understand, cried Taz. Your coming has shown me the future. You have given me the chance to change it. And by destroying you, Fiston Dantilus has destroyed his only chance of breaking free. His body will perish again, only this time, when his soul seeks another body to house it. I will stop him. Thus the young maid Raceland in the future will take the test in the Tower of High Sorcery, and he will die there. 
One by one the others will die, for without Raceland's help, Gold Moon will not find the discs of Nishikar. Thus, the beginning of the end for the world. No, I I didn't mean to do this. I I I I just wanted to to uh, to go with Caramon on on this adventure. He he needed me. The Kenders stared around frantically, seeking some escape. But though there seemed everywhere to run, there was nowhere to hide. Dropping to his knees before the black-clothed woman, Taz stared up at her. What have I done? What have I done? You have done such that even Paladine might be tempted to turn his back upon you, Kender. What, what will you do to me? Where will I go? I, I don't suppose you, 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 you could send me back to Caramon or back to my own time. Your time no longer exists. As for sending you to Caramon, that is quite impossible. You will remain here with me. So I may ensure that nothing goes wrong. Here in the abyss, oh, how long? The woman began to fade before his eyes, shimmering and finally vanishing into the nothingness around him. Not long, not long at all, or perhaps always. Tass turned to face the cleric. What, what does he mean? Not long or, or, or always? Though not dead, you are even now dying. Your life force is ebbing from you, as it must for any of the living who mistakenly venture down here. When you are dead, the gods will determine your fate. I see. Tass choked back a lump in his throat. I deserve it, I suppose. <sighs> oh, Tannis, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. The cleric gripped his arm painfully. The surroundings changed. The ground shifted away beneath his feet. But Tasselhoff never noticed. His eyes filling with tears, he gave himself up to dark despair, and hoped death would come quickly. The next thing Tass knew, a bed and a stool materialized before his eyes. Thank you, he stammered, sitting down upon the stool with a sigh. What about food and water? You will feel no thirst or hunger while you are here. We do this so you will not interrupt us, and so farewell. Oh, wait! Don't leave me alone. But the dark cleric disappeared, saying, "When you are dead, we will return your body to lands above and see that your soul speeds on its way. Until then, we have no more need of you." I'm alone. Task glanced around in despair. Alone until I die, I might as well die and get it over with. <sighs> At least I'll probably go someplace different. I hope. Fizban, uh, uh, that is Paladine. You probably can't hear me from down here. I don't suppose there's anything you could do for me anyway. But I did want to tell you before I die that. Oh, I didn't mean to cause all this trouble. Maybe that doesn't count for much, and I suppose it part of me went along with Caramon just because it sounded like so much fun. But part of me went because he had no business going back into the past alone. He was fuddled because of the drink, you see, and I promised Tika I'd look after him. Uh, oh, Fizban! If there were just some way out of this mess, I'd try my best to straighten everything out. Honestly. Hello there. What? Tass whirled around, half thinking he might see Fizban. He saw instead a short figure in a grey tunic. I said hello there. Oh, uh, he uh, hello. Tass stared at the figure. You're a gnome. Uh, pa pardon me for asking a personal question, but are you dead? Are you? No. Well, I'm not either. My name is Nimsh. Nice meeting you, Nimsh. I'm Tasselhoff Burfoot. Nice meeting you, Burfoot. The two shook hands. Will you、uh, be seated? Tass gestured politely toward the stool, but Nimsh gave the stool a scathing glance and sat down in a chair that materialized right beneath him. It was an amazing gnomish chair with all kinds of gears and levers. Unfortunately, these didn't seem to work very well. Will you tell me what you're doing here, Burfoot?、Uh, of course. 
Um, no one minds that we're talking, do they? Oh, they don't care. As long as we leave them alone, we're free to go around anywhere. Of course, anywhere looks about the same as here, so there's not much point. I see. How do you travel, Nimsh? With your mind, haven't you figured that out yet? No, probably not. Kenda would have been noted for their brains. Gnomes and Kenda are related, Nimsh. So I've heard. Nimsh obviously didn't believe it. Past decided to change the subject. So if, if, I, if I want to go somewhere, I just think of that place and I'm there? Within limits, of course. Oh, well, since we're here, Nimsh, tell me your story. Uh, well, as you know, all gnomes have life quests. My family's life quest was developing an invention that could take us to other dimensional planes. And uh, mine worked. It worked? Das sat up in astonishment. Perfectly. Nymph heaved a miserable sigh. Where is your device? Oh, they took it away, of course. Well, uh, can you imagine one, like you imagined up that chair? Why? Are you trying to find a way out of the abyss? Well, I have to. The Queen of Darkness will win the war otherwise, and it will all be my fault. Plus, I've got some friends who are in terrible danger. Well, one of them isn't exactly a friend, but he is an interesting person. And wh uh, wh while he did try to kill me by making me break the magical device, I'm certain it was nothing personal. Tass stopped. That's it! What's it? Look! Tass fumbled with his pouches. He opened one, then another. Here it is! He held the pouch open to show Nimsh. But just as the gnome was peering into it, Tass suddenly slammed it shut. Oh, are they watching? Will they know? Know what? J uh, just, w w will they know? No, I don't suppose so. Can't say for sure, but they're pretty busy waking up evil dragons, that sort of thing. Good. Now look at this, Nimsh. He opened his pouch and dumped out the contents. What does that remind you of? My dimensional traveling device. You're right. Well, mine didn't have all these jewels, but no, look. Oh, you've got it all wrong. I think that goes here, not there. Yes, see? And then this chain hooks on here, wraps around like so. Well, it, no, that's not quite the way it must go. Wait, I see. Uh, this has to fit in there for... Now I need another one of these red gizmos. Nimps began sorting through the jewels. Tass watched him, hope filling his heart. Of course, he thought with a pang, he had prayed to Fizban. He'd promised he'd try to straighten things out, and though finding a gnome wasn't quite what he'd had in mind, it was better than sitting around, waiting to die. Journeying toward the plains of Durgoth on their way to find the portal, Raistlin, Karaman, and Chrysania endured wretched weather and even worse conditions. Food at the occasional inns was barely edible. Raistlin was growing weaker and weaker, but was still determined to press on. Then the three were set upon and captured by a gang of bandits. During the fight, Karaman managed to kill one of them, but was subdued by four others. The mage was knocked to the ground. The leader of the outlaws was a half-ogre named Steeltoe, so named because of his steel peg leg. He kicked Raistlin in the head with it and rendered the mage unconscious, then bound his hands so that he couldn't cast any spells. The half-ogre tried to grab Chrysania's medallion, but it flared into brilliant light, shocking him painfully. This made the gang believe she was a witch. Nevertheless, Steeltoe planned to have his way with her back at their camp, then share her with his men. When Raistlin recovered consciousness, they would take him for a walk up a cliff and see to it that he accidentally fell. That way they could be rid of him without being cursed for murdering a black-robed mage. Back at the camp, Raistlin came too, and he and Karaman came up with a plan. When Steel Toe sent for the two of them, the big warrior would challenge the half-ogre to a fight to the death. Then Karaman would call upon the other outlaws to follow him instead. Raistlin freed himself from the thongs that bound him, using the tiny dagger all mages kept hidden for such emergencies. Seeing that many of the men were knights of Salamnia, the ancient order that served Paladine, who in normal times would seek to do good, Karaman realized that they had been driven to follow Steeltoe for protection in the hard times following the cataclysm. 
This gave him hope that his plan might succeed. Unable to resist what he thought would be an easy killing, Steelto went for it. He gave Karaman his sword. The half-ogre wielded a great broadsword with one hand and used his peg leg as a weapon as well. But Karaman had learned a lot during his time as a gladiator in Istar, and though he broke his sword during the fight, he was able to kill Steelto by smashing his brains out with a huge log that was lying nearby. Seeing their leader dead on the ground, the band of outlaws grumbled dangerously. When they saw Crescenia step in and heal Caramon's wounds with her God-given powers, they grew murderous, thinking she was a witch. But the big warrior held them off, telling them she was his witch, his woman. He promised the bandits she would do them no harm, that she obeyed his commands and those of the wizard. Then Raceland turned to the angry crowd of robbers and begged them to let the three go on their way peacefully. But Caramon had another idea. Caramon wrested the great sword from Steel Toe's death grip and raised it high as he stood in triumph above the body of his slain enemy. I've destroyed your leader. Now I claim the right to take his place. I ask only one thing, that you leave this life of butchery and robbery. We travel south. That got an unexpected reaction. South? They travel south! There was scattered cheering. Caramon stared at them, not understanding. Do you perchance seek the fabled wealth of the dwarves in Thorbarden? Asked the young man of noble bearing. Raceland whispered to Caramon, Tell them yes. We go south. We're going to attack the dwarves. Caramon's eyes opened wide. Attack Thorbarden! I'll explain later. Do as I tell you. It is your only way home, my brother. And maybe our only way out of here alive. Realizing he had to make a decision quickly, Caramon turned back to the men. We go south, it is true, but for our own reasons. What is this you say of wealth in Thorbarden? It is said that the dwarves have stored great wealth under the mountain, the young man answered. Others around him nodded. Wealth they stole from humans, added one. Aye, not just money, cried a third, but food. They'll eat like kings this winter while our bellies go empty. We've talked before of going south to take our share, the young man continued. But Steelto said things were well enough here. There are some, though, who had second thoughts. Caramon pondered, wishing he knew more of history. He had heard of the great Dwarfgate Wars, of course. His old dwarf friend, Flint, had talked of little else. Flint was a hill dwarf. He had filled Caramon's head with tales of the cruelty of the mountain dwarves of Thorbarden, saying much the same things, these men said. But to hear Flint tell it, the wealth the mountain dwarves stole had been taken from their cousins, the hill dwarves. If this were true, then Caramon might well be justified in making this decision. He could, of course, do as his brother commanded. But something inside Caramon had snapped in his tar. Never again would he obey Raceland blindly. Then he sensed Raceland's glittering eyes upon him, and he heard his brother's voice echo in his mind. Your only way back home... Caramon raised his head to look at the men around him. Will you come with us? There was a moment's hesitation. Several of the men came forward to talk to the young nobleman, who was now apparently their spokesman. He nodded, then faced Caramon. We would follow you without hesitation, great warrior. But what have you to do with this black-robed wizard? My name is Raislin. This man is my bodyguard. There was no response, only dubious frowns and doubtful looks. I am his bodyguard, that's true, Caramon said. But the mage's real name is Fistin Dantilus. At this, there were sharp intakes of breath among the men. The frowns changed to looks of respect, even fear and awe. My name is Garrick, the young nobleman said, bowing to the archmage with the old-fashioned courtesy of the Knights of Salamnia. We have heard of you, great one, and though your deeds are dark as your robes, we live in a time of dark deeds. We will follow you and the great warrior you bring with you. Stepping forward, Garrick laid his sword at Caramon's feet. Others followed suit, some eagerly, others more warily. These last, Caramon let go, knowing them for the cowardly ruffians they were. My army, Caramon said to himself, looking at the thirty or so men with a grim smile as he spread his blanket an hour later in Steel Toe's hut. Some, like Garrick, were noble, but most were ragged thieves, like most young soldiers, Caramon had often dreamed of becoming an officer. Now, unexpectedly, here was his chance. 
Plans tumbled over and over in his mind. The best route south, provisioning, supplies. These were flesh and blood problems, driving the dark and shadowy problems with his brother from his mind. Caramon glanced over to where Raceland lay huddled near the fire. Despite the heat, he was wrapped in his cloak and as many blankets as Crisani had been able to find. She herself slept on the other side of the fire. Caramon caught himself watching her in a different way than before, thinking thoughts that made his skin burn and his pulse quicken. Closing his eyes, he willed images of Tika, his wife, to come to his mind. But he had banished these memories for so long that they were unsatisfying. Tika was a hazy, misty picture, and she was far away. Crisania was flesh and blood, and she was here. Damn! Women! Irritably, Caramon flopped over on his stomach, determined to sweep all thoughts of females beneath the rug of his other problems. It worked. Weariness finally stole over him. As he drifted into sleep, one thing remained to trouble him. It was nothing more than a look. The strange look he had seen Raceland give him when Caramon had said the name Fiston Dantilus. It had been a look of stark, abject terror. As the band of men under Caramon's command traveled south toward the dwarven kingdom of Thorbardin, their fame grew, and so did their numbers. The fabled wealth beneath the mountain caused hundreds to join what soon became known as the Army of Fistandantilus. Before he knew it, Caramon was a general. Word of the army's coming soon reached the dwarves of Thorbardin. Duncan, king of the mountain dwarves, stood on the battlements of the fortress of Pax Tharkas, and consulted with Keras, legendary hero of Thorbardin. Keras counseled his king to negotiate with Rigar Fireforge, leader of the hill dwarves, in order to avoid war between kinsmen. Rumor had it that the plainsmen of Abenacinia were considering an alliance with the hill dwarves, and that both of these might join up with the army of Fistandantilus. Hoping at least to find out, Duncan agreed to talk. He assembled the seven clans of Thorbardin, including the Gully Dwarves and the Dewar, or Dark Dwarves, who were fierce fighters but could not be trusted. Duncan was the first king to unite all the mountain dwarves under one banner, but it was a shaky union. In war it might fall apart. The negotiations were critical to avoid disaster, but the negotiations were unsuccessful. The hill dwarves had abandoned Thorbardin long ago, feeling it was foolish to cut themselves off from the rest of the world. Now they felt that the mountain dwarves had stolen work, livestock, and treasure from them. But the mountain dwarves, for their part, knew the truth. That there was no great treasure beneath the mountain. That there was only enough food for the mountain dwarves themselves to survive the winter. The talks broke off. War was now inevitable. In Caramon's camp, new soldiers continued to arrive. Garrick, knight of Solamnia, and now Caramon's lieutenant, welcomed his own cousin, Michael, to camp. Also a knight, Michael had had misgivings about serving under Fistandantilus, but was won over by Garrick, who told him about General Caramon's virtues. Neither Garrick nor Michael was comfortable about the fact that the general kept a witch as his woman. As the two stood there, they heard shouting coming from inside Caramon's tent. Where are you going? Caramon demanded harshly. I'm moving out. Crisani gently folded her white clerical robes, and placed them in the chest that had been stored beneath her cot in Caramon's tent. We've been through this, Caramon growled in a low voice. It's not safe for you anywhere else. Stories about Crisania's witchcraft, the strange medallion she wore, of the reviled god Paladine, and her healing of the big warrior, had spread quickly through the camp. The cleric never left Caramon's tent, but the dark glances followed her. I've heard your stories of witch-burning, Caramon. But that was in a day and age far removed from this one. Whose tent are you moving to, then? My brother's? There is another small tent, similar to his. I will live in that one. You may post a guard if necessary. Crisania, I'm sorry. He took hold of her gently and turned her around, forcing her to face him. There is no one I trust, Crisania, unless it is myself. And even then, his breathing quickened, the hands on her arms tightened. I love you, Crisania. You're not like any other woman I've ever known. He felt her shudder involuntarily. I've seen you with my brother. It reminds me of the way I was in the old days. You cared for him so tenderly. 
Chrysania looked up at him, holding her robes close against her chest. This, too, is a reason, Caramon. I have sensed your growing affection for me. I do not feel comfortable sleeping in this tent with you. What you feel for me isn't love, Caramon. You are lonely. You miss your wife. It is her you love. Ha! What would you know of love? I love Tika, sure. I've loved lots of women. What do I know of love? I'll tell you. I... Oh, don't say it! Completely losing control of himself, Caramon grabbed her in his arms. Don't say you love Raislin! He doesn't deserve your love. He's using you like he used me. Let go of me. Can't you see her, you blind Crescenia? Uh, ahem. Pardon me, said a soft voice. There is urgent news. Crescenia's face went white. Caramon's hands loosened their hold. Scowling, he turned to face his twin. What news? Messengers have arrived from the south. The dwarves of Thorbarden are preparing for war. Raceland spoke with such intense passion that Caramon blinked at him in astonishment, and Crescenia raised her head to regard him with concern. Confused and uncomfortable, Caramon turned away. I don't know what else you expected, Raced. It was your idea, after all. We've made no secret of the fact that's where we're headed. In fact, it's practically become our recruiting slogan. Join up with Fist and Dantilus and raid the mountain. Caramon tossed this off thoughtlessly, but its effect was startling. Raceland went livid, his sunken eyes flaring, his fists still clenched. He took a step toward his brother. Crisania sprang to her feet. Caramon's hand closed over the hilt of his sword, but slowly, Raceland regained control. With a vicious snarl, he turned and walked from the tent. We are truly preparing for war, Caramon told Crisania coldly. I can't take time to worry about you. You'll continue to sleep here. I'll leave you alone. You may be certain of that. You have my word of honor. With this, he stepped outside the tent and began conferring with his guards. Flushing in shame, yet so angry she could not speak, Crisania too walked from the tent. One glance at the guards' faces, and she realized at once that part of their conversation had been overheard. Ignoring the curious glances, she looked around quickly and saw the flutter of black robes disappearing into the forest. Returning to the tent, she caught up her cloak and headed off in the same direction. Caramon saw Crisania enter the woods near the edge of camp. Though he had not seen Raceland, he had a pretty good idea of why Crisania was headed in that direction. He started to call to her. Though he did not know of any real danger lurking in the trees, in these times it was best not to take chances. As her name was on his lips, however, he saw two of his men exchange knowing looks. Caramon had a sudden, vivid picture of himself calling after the cleric like some lovesick youth, and his mouth snapped shut. Besides, here was Garrick coming up, followed by messengers of the hill dwarves and the plainsmen. Caramon realized he would have to meet with them. His gaze went once more to the forest. Ah, well, let Paladine look after her, if that was what she wanted. Gritting his teeth, Caramon turned to greet the messengers and lead them into his tent. Once he had exchanged formalities and made them comfortable, he excused himself and slipped out the back. Footsteps in the sand, leading me on. Looking up, I see the scaffold, the hooded figure with its head on the block, the executioner. The axe falls, the victim's severed head rolls on the wooden platform, the hood comes off. My head, Raceland whispered feverishly, twisting his hands together in anguish. The executioner, laughing, removes his hood, revealing my face. Raceland groaned, his fear spreading through his body like a malign growth. Clutching at his head, he tried to banish the evil visions that haunted his dreams continually. But they would not depart. He opened his eyes, but there was no escape. The trees surrounding him seemed like living demons closing in upon him. He squeezed his eyes shut again. Master of past and present, I am master of nothing. All this power and I am trapped, trapped, following in Fist and Dantilus's footsteps, knowing that every second that passes has passed before. I see people I've never seen, yet I know them. I hear the echo of my own words before I speak them. This face, his hands pressed against his cheeks, this face, his face, not mine. Who am I? I am my own executioner. Not realizing what he was doing, Raceland began to claw at his skin as though his face were a mask and he could tear it from his bones. Stop, Raceland, stop! Lifting his gaze, 
The maid saw Crisania standing before him, holding his hands away from his face, her eyes wide and filled with concern. Leave me alone! But even as he spoke, he sighed and lowered his head again, shuddering. I'm all right. No, you're not. Come, let me wash your face. Sharp words were on Raceland's lips, but the touch of warm human flesh was comforting after the cold fingers of death. Crisania put her arm around him, and Raceland allowed himself to be led to a nearby stream. Crisania dipped her cloth in the water and cleaned the wounds on his face. Tell me, she said, tell me what's wrong. I don't understand. You've been brooding ever since we left the tower. Has it something to do with the portal being gone? With what Estinus told you back in Palanthus? Raceland did not look at her, but some part of his mind was coldly balancing, calculating. Tell her? What will I gain? More than if I kept silent? Yes. Draw her nearer, enfold her, accustom her to the darkness. The portal is in a place near Thorbarden, in the magical fortress called Zaman. This I discovered from Astinus. Legend tells us that Fiston Dantilus undertook what some call the Dwarfgate Wars, so that he could claim the mountain kingdom of Thorbarden for his own. Astinus relates much the same thing in his chronicles. Much the same thing. But read between the lines. Read closely, as I should have read, but in my arrogance did not. And you will read the truth. Fiston Dantilus came here to do the very same thing I came here to do. He cared nothing for Thorbarden. He wanted one thing, and that was to reach the portal. The dwarves stood in his way as they stand in mine. They controlled the fortress then. They controlled the land for miles around it. The only way he could reach it was to start a war so that he could get close enough to gain access to it. And so, history repeats itself, for I must do what he did. I am doing what he did. His expression bitter, he stared into the water. From what I have read of Estinus's chronicles, Crisini began, there has long been bad blood between the hill dwarves and their cousins. You can't blame yourself, Raceland snarled impatiently. I don't give a damn about the dwarves. You say you have read Estinus's works on this? If so, think. What caused the end of the Dwarfgate Wars? Crisania's face paled. The explosion. The explosion that destroyed the plains of Durgoth. Thousands died, and so did... So did Fiston Dantilus, Raceland said with grim emphasis. For long moments, Crisania could only stare at him. Oh, but surely not. You're not the same person. The circumstances are different. They must be. No, the circumstances are not different. I am caught in time, rushing forward to my own doom. How do you know? How can you be certain? I know because one other perished with Fist and Dantilus that day. Who? An old friend of yours, Danubis. That much I learned from Astinus. If you will recall, your cleric friend from Istar was already drawn to Fiston Dantilus. He had his doubts about the church much like yours. Fiston Dantilus persuaded him to come. You didn't persuade me, Raceland. I chose to come. It was my decision. Of course, Raceland let go of her. He hadn't realized what he was doing, caressing her soft skin. Now unbidden, he felt his blood stir. This must not happen, he recommended himself. It will interfere with my plans. He started to rise, but Crisania took his hands and rested her cheek in his palm. No, Raislin, we will alter time, you and I. You are more powerful than Fist and Dantilus. I am stronger in my faith than Danubis. I heard the king priest's demands of the gods. I know his mistake. Paladine will answer my prayers as he has in the past. Together we will change the ending. You and I. Raceland felt her tenderness, and suddenly he was down on his knees beside her. His mouth sought her lips. His lips touched her eyes, her neck. She yielded to his fire, as she had yielded to his magic, kissing him eagerly. Raceland held her in his arms. Her skin was cool to his feverish touch, her lips like sweet water to a man dying of thirst. And then the shadow of a face appeared in his mind. A goddess, dark-haired, dark-eyed, 
exultant, victorious, laughing. The Dark Queen. No! He hurled Crisania from him. Trembling, he staggered to his feet. Raislin! She cried, clinging to his hand. Furiously, Raislin snatched his hand free. Then, his face grim, he reached out and ripped her robe from her shoulders. With his other hand, he shoved her half-naked body down into the leaves. Is this what you want, Crisania? If so, wait here for my brother. He's bound to be along soon. Crisania clutched the torn cloth to her breast and stared at him wordlessly. Is this what we have come here to attain? I thought your aim was higher, revered daughter. You boast of Paladine, of your powers. Did you think that this might be the answer to your prayers? That I would fall victim to your charms? Closing her eyes, Crisania sobbed in agony, clasping her torn robe to her body. Her black hair fell across her bare shoulders. The skin of her back was white and soft and smooth. Turning abruptly, Raceland walked rapidly away, feeling his calm return to him. The ache of passion subsided, leaving him once more able to think clearly. His eyes caught a glimpse of movement, a flash of armor. His smile curled into a sneer. As he had predicted, there went Caramon in search of her. Well, they were welcome to each other. What did it matter to him? Half an hour later, Caramon burst into Raceland's tent, his hand on the hilt of his sword. I should kill you, you bastard! What for this time? Have I murdered another of your pet kender? You know damn well what for! I found Lady Crisani in the woods, her clothes ripped off, crying her heart out. Did she tell you she offered herself to me, and that I turned her down? You arrogant son of a... And even now she probably sits weeping in her tent, thanking the gods that I love her enough to cherish her virtue. Raceland's mocking laugh pierced Caramon like a poisoned dagger. I don't believe you! Grabbing hold of his brother's robes, Caramon yanked Raceland from his chair. I don't believe her! She'd say anything to protect your miserable... Remove your hands, brother. I'll see you in the abyss. I said remove your hands. There was a flash of blue light, a crackle and sizzling sound, and Caramon screamed in pain, loosening his hold as a paralyzing shock surged through his body. I warned you, Caramon. By the gods, I will kill you this time. Caramon drew his sword with a trembling hand. Then do so. Try to kill me. You will never get home again. That doesn't matter. Overwhelmed by jealousy and hatred, Caramon took a step toward his brother, who sat waiting, that strange, eager look upon his face. Caramon raised his sword. General Caramon! Alarmed voices shouted outside. Caramon hesitated. General, where are you? Here. Turning from his brother, Caramon thrust the sword back into its scabbard and yanked open the tent flap. What is it? The witch, sir. She's gone. Gone? Caramon cast his brother a vicious glance and hurried out of the tent. Raceland closed his eyes with a sigh. Ahead of him, stretched out in a straight, narrow line, the footsteps of Fistendantilus stretched inexorably on. Crisania had ridden off on horseback, heading for a nearby village in the mountains. Her plan was to convert the inhabitants from their belief in the new false gods and to restore the worship of Paladine. This, she believed, would change history, saving Raceland from Fistendantilus's fate. But when she arrived at the village, she found that its inhabitants had been felled by the burning fever. Crisania revealed herself as a cleric of Paladine to the last survivor in the town, himself a cleric of the new gods. She knew that if she healed him and converted him to her faith, her plan would have succeeded. The young man accepted Paladine's existence, but he was so angry at the gods for allowing the world to be plunged into misery that he refused to be healed. Crisania watched him die. Her mission had failed. Meanwhile, Raistlin and Caramon set out in pursuit of Crisania. Along the way, the two brothers reconciled, rediscovering their old companionship and love for each other. Caramon stood guard while Raistlin slept, keeping the nightmares away, just as he had done when they were children. And Raceland, too, seemed to reach back and find the caring, loving part of himself again. When they reached the village and found Crisania, she was praying over the body of the young man. Then Raceland summoned great magic to incinerate the village of the dead. He called Crisania to join him in the center of a lightning storm and feel the power of the gods. 
she did so, and afterwards told him that she had rediscovered her faith through this trial, and vowed to help him enter the portal and put an end to evil forever. She now truly believed that their fate would be different from that of Fistendantilus and Danubus, because she and Raistlin truly cared about the world. On their way back to camp, Raistlin told Chrysania she had now passed two of the three tests she must face before entering the portal. The test of darkness, when she had come to him at the dark tower, the test of fire here at the village. Soon she would face the final test, the test of blood. The next day the army moved south again, heading for Thorbardin. Caramon was disturbed by his new awareness of Raistlin's power and the knowledge that all this had happened before, that he was merely a prisoner of fate. As for Raistlin, he spent every moment searching through his spell books, going over everything he had ever learned about the history of the Dwarf Gate Wars, trying desperately to learn Fistendantilus's fatal mistake. He almost gave up in despair at times. But then the answer came to him. Raistlin came out of his tent and approached Michael, his personal bodyguard. No one is to disturb me tonight. No one is to enter my tent for any reason, no matter what. No one. Lady Crisania, my brother, you, yourself. No one. I, I understand, my lord. You may hear or see strange things this night. Ignore them. Anyone who enters this tent does so at the risk of his own life and mine. You are a knight of Salamnia. Swear by the code and the measure to obey my command. Y yes, Lord, my honor is my life. Re-entering the tent, Raislin came to a large chest that sat upon the floor beside his bed. Lifting the lid, he calmly studied the contents, the spell books, the jars and bottles and pouches of spell components, an assortment of scrolls, and several black robes folded at the bottom. His gaze passed quickly over all the items, including one slim, well-worn book, the flamboyantly written title was Sleight of Hand Techniques. Below that was written, Astound Your Friends, Trick the Gullible. There might have been more, but the rest had been worn away long ago by young, eager hands. Looking at this book, which brought a thin smile to the mage's lips, he reached down among his robes and drew forth an ornate silver stand. Carefully, Raceland carried it to the table he had placed in the center of the tent. Settling himself into a chair... The mage put his hand into one of the secret pockets of his robes and pulled forth a small crystal object. Swirling with colors, it resembled at first glance nothing more sinister than a child's marble. Yet, looking at the object closely, one saw that the colors trapped within were alive. They could be seen constantly moving, shifting as though seeking escape. Graceland placed the marble upon the stand. It looked ludicrous perched there, much too small. And then, suddenly, as always, it was perfectly right. The marble had grown, the stand had shrunk. Perhaps Raceland himself had shrunk. For now the mage felt himself to be the one that appeared ludicrous. It was a common feeling, and he was accustomed to it, knowing that the dragon orb, for such was the shimmering, swirling, colored crystal globe, sought always to put its user at a disadvantage. But long ago, no, in time to come, Raceland had mastered the dragon orb and the essence of dragonkind that inhabited it. Relaxing, Raceland placed his fingers upon the crystal of the orb and spoke the ancient words. Ast belak, moi paralan. The swirling colors within the orb began to spin madly. Raceland fought the dizziness that assailed him. Keeping his hands firmly upon the orb, the colors ceased to swirl, and a light glowed in the center. Raceland blinked, then frowned. The light should have been neither black nor white, all colors, yet none, symbolizing the mixture of good and evil and neutrality that bound the essence of the dragons within the orb. Such it had always been, ever since the first time he had looked within the orb and fought for its control. But the light he saw now though much the same as he had seen before, seemed ringed round by dark shadows. Hovering about the edges were shadows of wings. Out of the light came two hands. Raceland caught hold of them and gasped. 
The hands pulled him with such strength that, totally unprepared, Raceland nearly lost control. What is the meaning of this? Raceland demanded sternly. Why do you challenge me? Long ago I became your master. She calls. Our queen calls, and we must obey. Come, master. We will take you. Come quickly. The queen. Raceland shuddered involuntarily. The hands, sensing him weakening, began to draw him in once more. Angrily, Raceland tightened his grip. The queen. Of course, he should have foreseen this. She had entered the world partially, and now she moved among the evil dragons. Banished from Crin long ago by the sacrifice of the Salamnic Knight Huma, the dragons, both good and evil, slept in deep and secret places, leaving the good dragons to sleep on undisturbed. The Dark Queen was awaking the evil dragons, rallying them to her cause, as she fought to gain control of the world. Though composed of the essences of all dragons, good and evil, the orb's present master was evil. This enhanced its evil side, and of course, the orb was also reacting strongly to the queen's commands. Are those shadows I see the wings of dragons, or shadows of my own soul? Raceland wondered, staring into the orb. He did not have leisure for reflection. However, the archmage saw his grave danger, lose control for an instant, and Tachesis. Would claim him. No, my queen," he murmured, keeping a tight grip upon the hands within the orb. "No, it will not be so easy as this." To the orb, he spoke softly but firmly. "I am your master still. I am ri." He hesitated, then said through clenched teeth, "I am Fist and Dantalus, master of past and of present, and I command you to obey me." The orb's light dimmed. The hands started to slip away. We obey, Master. Raceland breathed a sigh of relief. Very well. I must contact my apprentice in the Tower of High Sorcery in Palantis. Carry my voice through the ethers of time to Dalimar, the Dark Elf. Speak the words, Master. He shall hear them as he hears the beating of his own heart. And so shall you hear his response. Raceland nodded. When Raceland began his journey across time, he left his apprentice Dalimar in charge of the Tower of High Sorcery in Palanthus. But the Dark Elf was also in the service of Parsalian of the White Robes, head of all the mages of Crin, at whose orders he spied on Raceland. In the days following his master's departure, Dalimar was paid an unexpected visit at the tower by Raceland's half sister, the Dragon High Lord Kitiara. She had come to see Raceland. And was surprised to learn that he had gone back in time on his quest for the knowledge that would allow him to enter the portal. Kitiara had directed her companion, the undead knight lord Soth, to kill Crisania, ending any hopes Raistlin had of challenging the Dark Queen. But as Dalimar explained to her, Paladine had saved Crisania's life, taking her to his ethereal realms for protection until the king priest of Istar could cure her. Dalimar told Kitiara about Raistlin's plan to lure the Dark Queen from the Abyss to this world, where Raistlin hoped he could defeat her and take her place as a god. He explained that Parsalian and the Conclave of Mages feared the struggle would destroy the world. The Mages had directed Dalimar to stop Raistlin from returning through the portal, should the Archmage ever succeed in entering the Abyss. Ever the calculating mercenary. Kitiara listened carefully, trying to discern who the winner of this struggle would be. At the same time, she could not deny the strong attraction she felt for Dalimar. Clearly, he felt the same for her. The two became lovers, although neither trusted the other in the least. Soon after, Dalimar was contacted by Raistlin, speaking to him through the dragon orb. Raistlin directed Dalimar to visit the great library of Palanthus and find a particular volume of Astinus's chronicles dealing with the Dwarf Gate Wars. Dalimar did so, and Astinus, the ageless, deathless chronicler of Crin, gave him the volume in question to study. 
he took it with him to the tower. And there, in magical contact with his master, his Shalafi, Dalimar began to read aloud the passage in question. And the great archmage Vistandantilus used the dragon orb to call forward in time to his apprentice, instructing him to go to the great library at Palanthus and read in the books of history there to see if the result of his great undertaking would prove successful. Dalimar's voice faltered as he read this amazing statement. Continue, came his Shalafi's voice, tearing his gaze from the paragraph written hundreds of years ago, yet accurately reflecting the mission he had just undertaken. Dalimar continued, It is important here to note this. The chronicles, as they existed at that point in time, indicated that the undertaking would have been successful. Fistendantilus, along with the cleric Denubis, should have been able, from all indications that the great archmage saw, to safely enter the portal. What might have happened in the abyss, of course, is unknown since the actual historical events transpired differently. Thus, believing that his ultimate goal of entering the portal and challenging the Queen of Darkness was within his reach, Pistandantilus pursued the Dwarf Gate Wars with renewed vigor. The Mountain Dwarves' fortress of Pax Tharkas fell to the armies of the Hill Dwarves and the Plainsmen. Led by the great General Ferragas, the army of Fistendantilus drove back the forces of King Duncan, forcing the dwarves to retreat to Thorbarden. Little did Fistendantilus care for this war. It simply served to further his own ends. Finding the portal beneath the mountain fortress of Zaman, he established his headquarters there and began the final preparations that would allow him to enter the Forbidden Gates, leaving his general to fight the war. What happened at this point is beyond even me to relate with accuracy, since the magical forces at work here were so powerful it obscured my vision. General Ferragas was killed fighting the Dewar, the dark dwarves of Thorbarden. At his death, the army of Fistendantilis crumbled. The mountain dwarves swarmed out of Thorbarden toward the fortress of Zaman. During the fighting, Aware that the battle was lost and that they had little time, Vistendantilus and Anubis hastened to the portal. Here the great wizard began to cast his spell. As has been said, the undertaking would have been successful but for this fact. At the same instant, a gnome, being held prisoner by the dwarves of Thorbarden, activated a time-traveling device he had constructed in an effort to escape his confinement. Contrary to every recorded instance in the history of Grin, this gnomish device actually worked. It worked quite well, in fact. I can only speculate from this point on, but it seems probable that the gnome's device interacted somehow with the powerful spells being woven by Fistendantilus. The result we know all too clearly. A blast occurred of such magnitude that the plains of Durgoth were utterly destroyed. Both armies were almost completely wiped out. The towering mountain fortress of Zaman shattered and fell in upon itself, creating the hill now called Skullcap. The unfortunate Denubus died in the blast. Fistendantilus should have died as well, but his magic was so great that he was able to cling to some portion of life, though his spirit was forced to exist upon another plane until it found the body of a young magic user named Raceland Marcher. Enough! Yes, Shalafi. And then Raceland's voice was gone. Dalimar knew he was alone. Shivering violently, he sat lost in thought, seeking to make some sense of what he had read. Raceland's thin body quivered with excitement. One phrase shone with dazzling brilliance in his mind the undertaking would have been successful. Raceland's hands shook, and exultation swept over him. The footsteps in his dream led to a scaffold no longer, but to a door of platinum, decorated with the symbols of the five-headed dragon. At his command, it would open. He had simply to find and destroy this gnome. 
Raceland felt a sharp tug on his hands. Stop, he ordered, cursing himself for losing control. But the orb did not obey his command. Too late, Raceland realized he was being drawn inside. The hands had undergone a change, he saw, as they pulled him closer and closer. They had been unrecognizable before, neither human nor elven, young nor old. But now they were the hands of a female, soft, supple, with smooth white skin and the grip of death. Fighting down the hot surge of panic that threatened to destroy him, Raceland summoned all his strength, both physical and mental, and fought the will behind the hands. Closer they drew him, nearer and nearer. He could see the face now, a woman's face, beautiful, dark-eyed, speaking words of seduction that his body reacted to with passion, even as his soul recoiled in loathing. Desperately, Raceland struggled to pull away, Deep he delved into his soul, searching the hidden parts. But for what? He little knew. Some part of him somewhere existed that would save him. An image of a lovely white-robed cleric wearing the medallion of Paladine emerged. She shone in the darkness, and for a moment, the hand's grasp loosened. But only for a moment. Raceland heard a woman's sultry laughter. The vision shattered. My brother! Raceland called through parched lips, and an image of Caramon came forward. Dressed in gold and armor, his sword flashed in his hands. He stood in front of his twin, guarding him. But the warrior had not taken a step before he was cut down from behind. Nearer and nearer, Raceland's head slumped forward. He was rapidly losing consciousness, and then, unbidden, from the innermost recesses of his soul, came a lone figure. It was not robed in white. It carried no gleaming sword. It was small and grubby, and its face was streaked with tears. In its hand, it held only a dead, a very dead rat. Caramon arrived back in camp from his scouting mission to find the camp in an uproar. Everyone was shouting about the wizard. Caramon raced for Raceland's tent, only to find Michael guarding it. The poor knight was about to drop from exhaustion, but still refused to let anyone inside the tent. Crisania stood there panicked and furious but the young knight still kept his promise. Caramon started to push past Michael. The knight raised his spear, blocking his path. Out of my way, Caramon ordered. Sorry, sir. Fist and Dantalus told me no one was to pass. You see, Crisania said in exasperation, as Caramon fell back a pace, staring at Michael in perplexed anger. It's been like this all night, and I know something dreadful's happened inside, but Raceland made him take an oath by the code and the rules of some such thing. Caramon shook his head. The code and the measure. A code no knight will break on pain of death. But this is insane, Crisania cried. I heard Raceland screaming my name. I ran over here and saw flashes of light inside his tent. I heard him call your name, and then his voice began to, to fade, as though he were being sucked away somehow. Then he said something else. I could barely hear it. The lights went out, there was a sharp crack, and everything went still, horribly still. She closed her eyes, shuddering. What did he say? Could you understand? That's the strange part. It sounded like... Boo-poo. Boo-poo? Why would he call out the name of a gully dwarf? I've wanted the same thing, Caramon. But wasn't that the gully dwarf who told Parsalian how kind Raceland had been to her? Caramon shook his head. He would worry about gully dwarves later. His immediate problem was Michael. The guard would stand at his post now until he dropped, and then, when he awoke to find he had failed, he'd kill himself. There had to be some way around him. Caramon glanced at Crisania. She could use her clerical powers to spellbind the young man. Caramon shook his head. That would have the entire camp ready to burn her at the stake. Damn Raceland! Damn clerics! Damn the Knights of Salamnia, and damn their code and their measure! Heaving a sigh, he walked up to Michael. The young man raised his spear, but Caramon only smiled at him. Michael, I had a friend once, a knight of Salamnia. He, he's dead now. He died in a war far from here when... Oh, but that doesn't matter. Sturm was like you. He believed in the code and, and the measure. He was ready to give his life for them. But at the end, he found out there was something more important than the code and the measure. Life itself... Life, Michael. That's all there is. It's all we have. Not just our lives, but the lives of everyone on this world. It's what the code and the measure were designed to protect. But somewhere along the line, that got all twisted around, 
and the code in the measure became more important than life. He took a step forward. I'm not asking you to leave your post for any treacherous reason, and you and I both know you're not leaving it from cowardice. The gods know what you must have seen and heard tonight. I'm asking you out of compassion. My brother's inside there, maybe dying, maybe dead. When he made you swear that oath, he couldn't have foreseen this happening. I must go to him. Let me pass, Michael. There's nothing dishonorable in that. Michael's face suddenly crumpled. His shoulders slumped and his spear fell. Reaching out, Caramon caught the young man in his big arms as Michael heaved a shuddering sob. You there, Caramon called to another guard. Take over here. Caramon quickly entered the tent, followed by Crisania. Inside, the tent was charred, as though the place had been swept by fire. I can hear him breathing, Crisania said in relief. The archmage was lying on the floor. His face was ashen. Caramon carried him gently to his bed. In the dim light, he could see a faint smile on Raceland's lips. He's sleeping, Caramon said in a mystified voice. But something's happened. That's obvious. I wonder. Name of the gods? The dragon orb. The orb stood upon the table, resting on the silver stand Raceland had made for it. Once it had been an object of magical enchanting light. Now it was a thing of darkness, lifeless, a crack running down its center. It's broken, Caramon whispered. <laughs> Raceland soon recovered, and the army of Fist and Dantilus sailed from Salamnia to Abyssinia. There, they were met by the leaders of their new allies, the Hill Dwarves and the Barbarians of the Plains. Caramon was shocked to find that Rieger of Fireforge, leader of the Hill Dwarves, was the grandfather of his old friend Flint Fireforge. Suddenly, the fact that he had gone back in time hit Caramon full force. There were greater difficulties when the plainsmen arrived in camp. These barbarians and the hill dwarves had a deep distrust of each other that threatened to undo the alliance. Caramon, using diplomatic skills he never knew he had, gave a banquet at which he tried to forge bonds between the races. He had the leaders of the two groups compete to see who could retrieve a beautiful sword and a fine battle axe that had been placed at the top of a greased pole. But so cunningly had Caramon set up his little game. That the only way either man could retrieve the prizes was to cooperate with the other. After much competing, the two contestants got the idea. The dwarf sat upon the plainsman's shoulders and grabbed the magnificent weapons to great cheers from both groups of fighters. From then on, having had to rely on each other once, a precedent had been set that would set the pattern for the future. Caramon had shown himself to be an able general at getting his troops to act as one army. Now he would have to devise a plan of battle that would lead that army to victory. At the same moment that Caramon was busy at the banquet, a secret meeting was going on in Raceland's tent. A fateful meeting between enemies, where both participants were about to betray their own sides. You, Fist and Dantilus, I am. I am Argot, Thane of the Dure. I receive your message. We are uh, interested, but we must know more. Meaning, what's in it for us? Extending his slender hand, Raceland pointed to an open coffer in a corner of his tent. It began to glow. Argot sucked in his breath, full of wonder. Go examine it for yourself. You may take it with you tonight, if we come to terms. Argot fell to his knees, plunging his hands into the coffer of steel coins that shone with a magical gleam. You have plan? Yes. Spies tell us that your king Duncan plans to meet our army on the plains in front of Pax Tharkas, intending to defeat us there. If we are winning, he will withdraw his army of mountain dwarves back into the fortress, close the gates and operate the mechanism that drops thousands of tons of rocks down to block those gates. With the stores of food and weapons he has cached there, he can wait until we either give up and retreat, or until his reinforcements arrive from Thorbarden to pen us up in the valley. Am I correct? Your information accurate. Good. My plan is simple. 
Duncan will be inside the fortress itself. He will not take the field. He will give the command to shut the gates. When that command comes, the gates will not shut. That easy. That easy. Those who would shut them die. All you must do is hold the gates open until we have time to storm them. Pax Darkus will fall. Your people join up with us. Easy but for one flaw. Our families in Thorbarden. What become of them if we turn traitor? Nothing. Reaching into a pouch at his side, the mage pulled forth a scroll. You will have this delivered to Duncan. Handing it to Argot, he motioned. Read it. Frowning, the dwarf looked at the scroll. This? This in language of my people? Of course, what did you expect? Duncan would not believe it otherwise. But that language is secret. Not only to the Dewar and a few others, such as Duncan, King... Read! I haven't got all night. Muttering an oath to Reorks, the dwarf read the scroll. Then, rising, he rolled it back up. You're right. This solved everything. I surprised you willing to betray your own army. He stared intently at Raceland, who had turned his gaze impassively. I want, um, something else to give to Duncan, the Dewar finally said. Not just scroll. Something, uh, impressive. What does your kind consider impressive? A few dozen hacked-up bodies? Argot grinned. Ooh, the head of your general. There was a long silence. Agreed. Raceland's voice was without emotion. See that you keep your part of the bargain. Two of Argot's underlings lifted the heavy chest between them and hurried off to the forest. Argot watched them, then turned to face the mage. Do not worry, friend. We not fail you. No, friend. You won't. You see, Argot, that money has been cursed. If you double-cross me, you and anyone else who has touched it will see your hands turn black and begin to rot away. And when your hands are a bleeding mass of stinking flesh, the skin of your arms and your legs will blacken. When you can no longer stand on your decaying feet, you will drop over dead. You! You're lying! Raceland said nothing. Cursing under his breath, Argot hurried off, wiping his hands frantically upon his trousers. The battle for Pax Tharkas began. Through the treachery of Argat and his doer, who kept the gates open, the invading army of Fistandantilus indeed succeeded in taking the fortress. The defending army of the mountain dwarves would have been wiped out, but for the heroism of a lowly troop of gully dwarves who fought a suicidal rearguard action while the bulk of Duncan's army retreated to fight another day. As he rode into the fortress with the victorious army of Histendantilus, Raistlin saw the bodies of the gully dwarves littering the courtyard. Realizing that this wasn't in the history books, he reflected that perhaps history had already been changed. Then he realized the bitter truth. These poor creatures and their heroic death had been forgotten because no one cared. That night, Crisania passed her trial by blood, healing the wounded of both sides. The next morning, an exhausted Caramon was awakened to the news that his army, at Raistlin's order, was ready to march again. Caramon knew this was a fatal mistake. They needed to wait for their supply wagons to catch up with them before marching. Raistlin had succeeded in convincing the impatient hill dwarves that now was the time to press their advantage. But Caramon knew the truth. Raistlin cared for only one thing. He had to reach the magical fortress of Zaman at once in order to get to the portal in time. Raistlin cared nothing for his army. As far as he was concerned, they were all doomed. Up to now, Caramon had proceeded on the assumption that he could change history, that his army could win. Now he saw that he was merely following in the footsteps of history. His men were doomed. With a heavy heart, he left Michael in charge of Pax Tharkas and rode off at the head of his doomed troops. In Thorbarden, the army of the mountain dwarves regrouped. They had been thoroughly defeated at Pax Tharkas by Caramon's army and had been lucky to escape with their lives. Now the astonishing news of the enemy's quick advance reached them. A wave of excitement swept through the underground kingdom. By marching forward before they could secure their supply lines, the enemy army was making itself vulnerable. The tide of the war could be turned in one stroke. There was another development as well. 
a development known only to Duncan himself. Now he called his greatest general, a dwarf named Keras. Duncan showed Keras the letter he'd just received from Argat, Thane of the Treacherous Dewar. Keras read it aloud. Duncan of the Dwarves of Thorbarden, King. Greetings from the Dewar, those you now call traitor. This scroll is delivered to you from us, who know that you will punish Dewar under the mountain for what we did at Pax Tharkis. If this scroll is delivered to you at all, it means that we succeed in keeping the gates open. The enemy is led by the wizard now. Wizard is friend of ours. He make army march for the plains of Durgath. We march with them, friend with them. When the hour to come, those you call traitor will strike. We will attack the army of Fist and Dantilus from within and drive them under your axe blades. If you have doubt of our loyalty, hold our people hostage beneath the mountain until we return. We promise great gift we deliver to you as proof loyalty. Signed, Argot of the Dure Thane. Well, demanded Duncan. Cars frowned darkly. I have nothing to do with traitors. But if they are sincere, Caris, this could give us a great victory. Their objective is, according to our spies, the fortress of Zaman. We have a small garrison there that will make a token defense and then retreat, hopefully drawing them out into the open. Zaman, Karas muttered. Thane, if I can present a plan that will end this war with a minimum of bloodshed, will you allow me to try? I listen. Give me a hand-picked squadron of men, Thane, and I will undertake to kill this Fistandantilis. When he is dead, I will show this scroll to his general and to our kinsmen. They must surely surrender. And what are we to do with them if they do surrender? Or give them Pax Tharkis, Thane. Those who want to live there, of course. Our kinsmen will undoubtedly return to their homes. We could make a few concessions to them, but there would be shelter and protection for the humans and our kinsmen at the fortress during the winter. They could work in the mines. The plan has possibilities, but it is a dangerous course, Karis. Even if you succeed in killing the Dark One, and I remind you he is said to be a wizard of great power, there's every possibility you will be killed before you can talk to this General Marseille. Rumor has it, he is the wizard's twin brother. Kara smiled wearily. That is a risk I will take gladly. Very well. You have our leave. Choose your men with care. When will you go? Tonight, Thane. The gates of the mountain will open to you, then they will close. Whether they open again to admit you victorious, or to disgorge the armed might of the mountain dwarves, will be dependent upon you, Karis. May Reox's flame shine on your hammer. Bowing, Karis turned and walked from the hall, his step swifter and more vigorous than it had been when he entered. Duncan sighed sadly as he watched Karis go. No, he said to himself, we must prepare for war. No water again. Garamon glanced around at his army. They were losing before the battle even began. After days of forced marching, their supplies had still not caught up with them. Spirits were low. There were grumblings as the food dwindled. Karaman knew if the supplies didn't catch up with them soon, even this small amount would be cut in half. But the general had more critical concerns. One was a lack of fresh water. Though Rieger had told him confidently that there were water holes in the plains, the first two they discovered were dry. Another problem was the rapidly deteriorating relationships between the Allies. The humans blamed their problems on the dwarves and the plainsmen. The plainsmen, for their part, were beginning to think that all the gold in the world wasn't so beautiful as the golden grasslands of their home. Karaman knew that one morning he would awake and find they had gone. The dwarves, for their part, viewed the humans as cowardly weaklings who ran away the minute things got a little tough. They treated the lack of food and water as a petty annoyance. The dwarf who even dared hint he was thirsty was immediately set upon by his fellows. Karaman thought of this as he stood in the desert that evening. Up until now, he had had hope. He had believed Raceland wouldn't let this happen. Now he knew his men were doomed. Nothing he could do could prevent the preordained end. Knowing the pain this would inevitably cost him, Karaman unconsciously began to distance himself from those he had come to care about. He began to think about home. 
It was the one thought that kept him going. As he led his army closer and closer to their defeat, each step led him closer to Tika, closer to home. Look out there! Rieger grabbed hold of him, shaking him from his reverie. Karaman blinked and looked up just before he stumbled into one of the strange mounds that dotted the plains. What are these confounded contrivances anyway? Karaman grumbled, glaring at it. Some type of animal dwelling? Dwarves built these. Can't you tell? They're observation posts. What do they observe, snakes? The land, the sky, armies, like ours. Rieger stamped his foot, raising a cloud of dust. Hear that? Hollow. Karaman's eyes opened wide. Tunnels. Looking around at mound after mound rising up out of the flatlands, he whistled softly. Rieger nodded his head. Legend has it there were once fortresses between here and Pax Tharkas, connecting up with the Corollis Mountains. Yeah, a dwarf could walk from Pax Tharkas to Thorbarden without ever once seeing the sun. Well, if the old tales be true. The fortresses are gone now. Many of the tunnels in all likelihood. Cataclysm wrecked most of them. Still... I wouldn't be surprised if Duncan hadn't a few spies down there. Caramon's gaze scanned the flat, empty land. Above or below, they'll see us coming from a long way off. In one of the mounds, not far from Caramon's tent, eyes were watching the army's every move. But the eyes weren't interested in the army itself. They were interested in three people only. Not long, no, Kara said. He was peering out through slits so cunningly carved into the rock that they allowed those in the mound to look out, but prevented anyone from seeing in. There comes the wizard from his tent, and here comes the witch from hers. Grasping the handle of his hammer with one hand, Karis used the other hand to shift a short sword he had tucked into his belt into a more comfortable position. He reached into a pouch, drew out a piece of rolled parchment, and tucked it into a safe pocket in his leather armor. Turning to the four dwarves who stood behind him, he said, Remember, do not harm the woman or the general any more than is necessary to subdue them. But the wizard must die, and quickly, for he is the most dangerous. The others started to move, but Kara stopped them. Let them start their evening meal. Relax. Then they strike. What was that? Karaman asked, putting down his fork. The wind, Krasinia muttered. It blows incessantly in this horrid place. Caramon half rose, hand on his sword belt. Oh, it wasn't the wind. Raceland glanced up at his brother. Oh, sit down and finish your dinner. I must return to my studies. Shoving his still full plate aside, Raceland started to stand, when the world literally gave way beneath his feet. Staring down in amazement, the archmage saw a vast hole opening up before him. Instinctively, Raceland caught hold of the table and managed to save himself from falling into the rapidly widening pit. But even as he did, he saw figures crawling up through it, squat, bearded figures. Caramon! Raceland shouted, but he could tell by the sound behind him, a vicious oath and the rattle of a steel sword sliding from its scabbard, that Caramon was well aware of the danger. Raceland heard, too, a strong feminine voice calling on the name of Paladine, and saw the glimmering outline of pure white light. But he had no time to worry about Crescenia. A huge dwarven warhammer, seemingly wielded by the darkness itself, was aimed right at the mage's head speaking the first spell that came to his mind. Raceland saw with satisfaction an invisible force pluck the hammer from the attacking dwarf's hand. Planning to end the attack quickly, the archmage turned his attention to his enemy, who stood before him, regarding him with eyes that were unafraid. Stretching out his hands, Raceland began to pronounce the words that would send bolts of blue lightning sizzling through his enemy's body. Then he was interrupted. With the suddenness of a thunderclap, two figures appeared before him, leaping out of the darkness at him as though they had dropped from a star. Tumbling at the mage's feet, one of the figures stared up at him in wild excitement. Oh, look, it's Raceland. We made it, Nimsh. We made it. Hey, Raceland, bet you're surprised to see me, huh? And oh, have I got the most wonderful story to tell you. You see, I was dead. Well, I wasn't actually, but... Tasselhoff. Thoughts sizzled in Raceland's mind as the lightning might have sizzled from his fingertips. The first, a kender. The second, time can be altered. The third, I can die. The shock jolted through Raceland's body. The words of the spell slipped from his mind, but his enemy still advanced. Reacting instinctively, Raceland jerked his wrist, bringing into his palm the small silver dagger he carried with him. But it was too late, and too little.
The wizard was wounded, mortally. That much Karas knew. He saw the hilt of his short sword sticking out of the mage's gut. He saw the wizard's slender hands curl around it. He heard him scream in terrible agony. He knew he had no reason to fear. The wizard could harm him no longer. Karas reached out and jerked the sword free. The wizard pitched forward onto the ground and lay still. Karas had time to look around then. His men were fighting with the general, who, hearing his brother scream, was livid with fear and anger. The witch was nowhere to be seen. The eerie white light that had shone from her was gone. The two apparitions the archmage had summoned were staring down in horror at the wizard's body. Karas was startled to see that these demons were nothing more sinister than a kender in bright blue leggings and a balding gnome. But Karas didn't have time to ponder this. His main concern was getting his men out safely. Running across the tent, Karas picked up his warhammer and flung it straight at Karamon. The hammer struck the man a glancing blow on the head, knocking him out but not killing him. Karamon dropped like a felled ox, and suddenly the tent was deathly silent. It had all taken but a few short minutes. Glancing through the tent flap, Karas saw the young knight who stood guard lying senseless upon the ground. There was no sign that anyone sitting around those far-off fires had heard or seen anything unusual. The wizard lay in a pool of his own blood. The general lay near him, his hand reaching out for his brother as though that had been his last thought before he lost consciousness. In a corner lay the witch on her back, her eyes closed. Seeing blood on her robes, Karis glared sternly at his men. One of them shook his head. Oh, I'm sorry, Karis, but her light was so bright it split my head open. I had to stop it. She's not hurt badly. All right, Karas nodded. Let's get out of here. His men hurried to the tunnel entrance as Karas took out the parchment and laid it next to Karaman's outstretched hand. What about the kinder and the gnome, Karas? One asked. Take them. We can't leave them here. They'll raise the alarm. For the first time, the kinder seemed to come to life. No, you can't take us. We just got here. We found Karaman and now we can go home. Take them. No, you don't understand. We were in the abyss and we escaped. Gag him! Motioning for his men to hurry, Karas knelt beside the hole in the ground. His men descended into the tunnel, dragging the gagged Kender. The gnome, in a state of shock, quietly did whatever he was told. Karas was the last to leave the tent. Leaping into the hole, he ran a safe distance down the tunnel, then stopped. Grabbing up the end of a length of rope lying on the tunnel floor, he gave the rope a sharp yank. There was a low rumble, and he could see stone falling. The tunnel now safely blocked behind him, Karas hurried after his men. Graceland lay on his bed, his hands clenched over the horrible wound. Every breath he drew was torture. Kneeling down beside the bed, Karaman laid a hand upon his twin's feverish head. Why didn't you let them send for Crescenia raised? Paladine will not heal me. But you're dying. You can't die. You said time altered, all changed. Karaman shuddered. His brother's face was not a face he knew. The mask of wisdom and intelligence had been stripped away, revealing the splintered lines of pride, ambition, avarice, and unfeeling cruelty beneath. It was as if Karaman was seeing his twin for the first time. At least let me dress the wound. No, end it. I have failed. The gods are laughing. I, I can't bear. Suddenly, irrationally, anger took hold of Karaman. Reaching out, Karaman grasped the black robes and jerked his brother's head up off the pillow. No, by the gods. No, you will not die. All your life, you have lived only for yourself. Now, even in your death, you seek the easy way out. For you. You'd leave me trapped here without a second's thought. You'd leave Crescenia. You will live, damn you. You'll live to send me back home. What you do with yourself after that is your concern. Raceland looked at Garamon, and despite his pain, a gruesome parody of a smile touched his lips. His eyes devoured Garamon with bitter hatred and rage. Garamon rose to his feet. I'm going to tell Crescenia. At least she must have the chance to try to heal you. Yes, if looks could kill, I know I'd be dead right now. But listen to me. Raceland or Fist and Dantilus or whoever you are. If it is Paladine's will that you die, then so be it. I'll accept that fate and so will Crescenia. But if it is his will that you live, we'll accept that too. And so will you. 
stepping outside into the night, heading quickly for Crisania's tent. The big warrior reached into his armor and withdrew the piece of parchment Garrick had found and given him. The words were few and simple. The wizard has betrayed you and the army. Send a messenger to Thorbarden to learn the truth. Caramon tossed the parchment upon the ground. What a cruel and twisted joke. Through the hideous torment of his pain, Graceland could hear the laughter of the gods. How they must revel in his defeat. His tortured body twisted in spasms, and so did his soul, burning with the knowledge that he had failed. Weak, puny human, he heard the voices of the gods shout. Thus do we remind you of your mortality. He would not face Paladine's triumph. Better to die swiftly, let his soul seek what dark refuge it could find. But that bastard brother of his, to deny him this, this last blessed solace. He could hear himself begging Caramon to kill him as a bright white light pierced his mind. The light shone more brightly, and it became a face of light. A beautiful, calm, pure face with dark, cool, gray eyes. Cold hands touched his burning skin. Let me heal you. The light hurt, worse than the pain of steel. Screaming, Raceland tried to escape, but the hands held him firmly. Let me heal you. Get away! Let me heal you! Very well. Let the god laugh. He's earned it after all, Raceland thought bitterly. Let him refuse to heal me, and then I'll rest in the darkness. Shutting his eyes tightly against the light, Raceland waited for the laughter and saw suddenly the face of the god. Looking at the hideous death mask that was Raceland's face, Caramon was horrified to realize that his brother was alive. Uncertain whether he should feel thankful or only more deeply grieved, Caramon watched life return to his twin's torn body. Crisania stood up. A smile crossed her face. Then, pressing her hand to her side, she sagged against Caramon. There was fresh blood on her white robes. You should heal yourself, Lady Crisania. Perhaps tomorrow. This night, a greater victory is mine. Don't you see? This is the answer to my prayers. It is your answer too, Caramon. This is the sign from the gods we have both sought. Are you still as blind as you were in the tower? Don't you yet believe? We place the matter in Paladine's hands, and the god has spoken. Raceland was meant to live. He was meant to do this great deed. Together, he and I and you, if you will join us, will fight and overcome evil as I have fought and overcome death this night. Karas returned to Thorbarden to report to Duncan, only to find that their spies had gotten there first, with the news that Raistlin, or Fistendantilus as they called him, had been healed by the witch. Duncan interviewed Tass and Nimsh. Tass told him the whole story. But Duncan believed he was lying, and ordered Tass and Nimsh thrown in the darkest dungeon in Thorbarden. Their cellmates were several Dewar, sick with plague, who were being held hostage by the mountain dwarves. The Dewar robbed Tass of his pouches. Fortunately, Nimsh had the magical device safely hidden in his boot. Safely, that is, until Raistlin materialized in their cell. Tass explained to Raistlin that he and Nimsh had met in the abyss, and that the gnome had improved the device so that they could both travel forward in time to where Karaman was. Raistlin demanded that they give him the device, and Nimsh did so at Tass's urging. Once he held it, Raistlin cast a fireball spell, killing Nimsh instantly. Satisfied that he had now averted Fistendantilus's fate, that no gnome would activate a magical time travel device at the moment Raistlin was trying to enter the portal, the mage departed back to Zaman with the horrified Kender in tow. No one had set foot inside the magical fortress of Zaman for centuries. The dwarves viewed it with suspicion. The fortress had been raised up out of the ground by magic, and it was magic that still held it together. Has to be magic, Rieger Fireforge grumbled to Karaman, giving the thin spires of the fortress a scathing glance. Otherwise it would have toppled over long ago. Rieger's army of hill dwarves, refusing to go inside the place, set up camp on the plains. The plainsmen did likewise. They felt uneasy in any building. The humans, scoffing at these superstitions, 
entered the ancient fortress, laughing loudly about spooks and haunts. They stayed one night. The next morning found them setting up camp in the open, muttering about fresh air and sleeping better beneath the stars. You seem to know your way around here, Caramon observed to his brother as they walked through the fortress. Bracelin glanced sharply at his twin. Do you not understand, my brother? I have never been here, yet I have walked these halls. I know the location of every room. Caramon slowly looked around toward his twin. Then, Fist and Dantilis, you know that this is also going to be your tomb. Crisani regarded Caramon with cold gray eyes. The gods are with us. They were not with Fist and Dantilis. We will not fail. On the first level of the great magical fortress of Zaman were huge stone-carved halls that had, in past days, been places of meeting and celebration. On the upper levels were large bedrooms filled with old-fashioned furniture, the beds covered with linens preserved through the years by the dryness of the desert air. Caramon, Lady Crisania, and the officers of Caramon's staff slept in these rooms. They woke up occasionally during the night, thinking they had heard ghostly voices, but no one mentioned these in the daylight. After a few nights, these things were forgotten, swallowed up in larger worries about supplies, and reports from spies that the dwarves of Thorbarden were massing a huge, well-armed force. There was also in Zaman, on the first level, a corridor that appeared to be a mistake. Anyone venturing into it discovered a short hallway that ended in a blank wall. But the corridor was not a mistake. When the proper hands were laid upon that blank wall, when the proper words were spoken, a door appeared, leading to a great staircase. Down, down the staircase went, down into darkness. Down, it seemed, into the very core of the world, the proper person could descend down into the dungeons of Zaman. One more time. We will go over it again. Tell me about the abyss, everything you remember, how you entered, what the landscape is like, who and what you saw, the queen herself, how she looked, her words. Ugh, he's no use to me at all. Lying upon a sweat-soaked pillow, Tass saw the black-robed figure hover over him an instant. Then, with a flutter and swirl of robes, it stalked out of the room. Cass tried to lift his head to see where Raceland was going, but the effort was too great. He fell back limply. As if from a distance, he heard Raceland talking to a squat, dark figure. Tass tried to listen, but his mind kept doing strange things, going off to play somewhere without inviting his body along. Give him more potion. That should keep him quiet. There's little chance anyone will hear him down here, but I can't risk it. When I'm gone, lock the door after me and extinguish the light. Should my brother discover the magical door, he will undoubtedly come down here. He must find nothing. All these cells should appear empty. The figure muttered, and the door squeaked on its hinges. Raislin, don't leave. Help me. But the door banged shut. The short, dark figure shuffled over to Tass's bedside. A dwarf? Flint? Is it you? No, who are you? Shut up, you bastard! Drink this or I'll pull your hair out by the roots. Sobbing, Tass drank the potion down. Then he lay back on his pillow. Within moments, the pain in his limbs left him, and clear, sweet waters closed over his head. Crisania came out of a dream with the distinct impression that someone had called her name. The feeling was so intense that she was immediately wide awake. Someone was in the room with her. She glanced about swiftly, she could see nothing, but she heard movement. Crisania opened her mouth to call the guard and felt a hand upon her lips. Then Raislin materialized out of night's darkness, sitting on her bed. Forgive me for frightening you, revered daughter. I need your help, and I do not wish to attract the attention of the guards. I wasn't frightened. He was so near, he could feel her trembling. I was dreaming. But you said you needed my help. Why? Raislin looked at her intently. Tasselhoff is here. Tasselhoff? Yes, and he is deathly ill. I need your healing skills. But I, I don't understand. You said he had returned to our own time. So I believed, but apparently I was mistaken. The magical device brought him here, to this time. He's been wandering the world in the manner of Kender, enjoying himself thoroughly. 
Eventually, hearing of the war, he arrived here to share in the adventure. Unfortunately, he has contracted the plague. This is terrible. Of course I'll come. Catching up her cloak from the end of the bed, she wrapped it around her shoulders. We must travel the pathways of the night, revered daughter. As I told you, I do not want to alert the guards. But why not? What will I tell my brother? If I tell him the truth, it will be a worry to him, at a time he can ill afford to add to his burdens. Tass has broken the magical device. That will upset Caramon, too, even though he is aware I plan to send him home. But I should tell him the candor is here. Crisania frowned. Caramon has looked worried lately. The army is crumbling around him, Crisania. The plainsmen talk every day of leaving. The dwarves are an untrustworthy lot, pressuring Caramon into striking before he is ready. The supply wagons have vanished. On top of all this, to have a kender roaming about, distracting him. Still, I cannot, in honor, keep this from him. Crisania's lips tightened. No, Raceland. I do not think it would be wise to tell him. If the kender is ill, but he will be weak for several days, it would only be an added worry to your brother. The archmage sighed. Very well, revered daughter. I will be guided by you in this. We will not tell Caramon that the Kender has returned. As he said, the words of magic that would transport them to the Kender, Corsania, for the briefest moment, saw a smile flit across Raceland's face, and then it was gone. You are keeping him here, in the dungeons? Shirak. He lies over there. How can you keep him locked up in the darkness like this? Have you ever treated plague victims before, Lady Corsania? No, of course not. The plague never came to Palanthus. It never struck the beautiful, the wealthy. Well, it came to us. It swept through the poorer sections of Haven. There were no healers, of course. I was the only one to minister to them. And there was not much I could do. But one thing I discovered. Light hurts their eyes. Those who recovered were occasionally stricken blind by... A terrified shriek from the kinder interrupted him. Tasselhoff was staring at him wildly. Please, Raislin, I'm trying to remember. Don't take me back to the Dark Queen. Hush, Tass, Crisania said. It's Lady Crisania. I'm going to help you. Tass transferred his wide-eyed, feverish gaze to the cleric, regarding her blankly for a moment. Then, with a sob, he clutched at her. Don't let him take me back to the abyss, Crisania. Oh, don't let him take you. It's horrible, horrible. What strange delusions. Crisania glanced up at Raislin. Is this common with plague victims? The mage nodded, kneeling down by the bedside. Sometimes it's best to humor them. Raceland laid his hand upon the kender's chest. Instantly, Taz collapsed back onto the bed, shrinking away from the mage. I'll be good, Raceland. Don't hurt me. Not like poor Nimsh. Lightning! Lightning! I'm not going to hurt you, Taz. Shh. Lie still. Seeing that Crisania had begun communing with her god and was lost in prayer... Raceland hissed, Tell me, Tass, tell me what the Dark Queen said. The Kender's face lost its feverish flush as Crisania's soft words flowed over him. A faint glimmering of sense returned to his eye, but he never took his gaze from Raceland. She told me before we left. Tass choked. Left? I thought you said you escaped. Tass tried to tear his gaze away from the mage, but Raceland's eyes, glittering in the light of the staff, held the kender fast. I, I, I thought we were escaping. We used the, the, the device and began to uh, to rise. I, I saw the, the, the abyss fall away beneath my, my feet, and, and, and it wasn't empty anymore. There, 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 there were shadows, and, and... Oh, Raceland, don't make me remember. Don't make me go back there. Hush! Raceland covered Tass's mouth with his hand. Crisania glanced up in concern, only to see Raceland tenderly stroking the kender's cheek. He is better, she said. But dark shadows hover around him, preventing Paladine's healing light from restoring him fully. Whatever it is seems very real to him. It must have been something dreadful. Perhaps, lady, if you left, he would feel more comfortable talking to me. We are such old friends. True. Crisania started to rise to her feet. To her amazement, Tass grabbed her hands... Don't leave me with him, lady. He killed nymphs. Burning lightning. There, there, Tass. No one's going to hurt you. Whoever killed this nymph can't harm you now. 
You're with your friends, isn't he, Raislin? Yes, my magic is powerful. Remember that, Tasselhoff. Remember the power of my magic. Tass lay back down, pinned by the major's gaze. Yes, Raislin. These dark fears will hinder the healing process. I will return to my room on my own with Paladine's help. So we agree not to tell Caramon. Raislin glanced at Crisania out of the corner of his eye. Yes, this would only worry him unnecessarily. Tasselhoff, talk to Raislin. Unburden your soul. Then sleep. May Paladine be with you. Did did you say Caramon? Is he here, Crisania? Yes, and when you've rested, I'll take you to him. Oh, couldn't I see him now? He's very busy, Raislin said. He is a general now, Tasselhoff. He has armies to command, a war to fight. He has no time for Kender. No, I I suppose not. Tass sighed and lay back on his pillow, his eyes still on Raislin. With a final pat on his head, Crisania stood up, holding the medallion of Paladine in her hand. She whispered a prayer and vanished into the night. And now, Tasselhoff, we are alone. Tass couldn't speak. He could only stare at the archmage in growing horror. You remember Dalimar, my apprentice, Tass? Do you remember the wounds upon his chest? I made those blackened, ever festering holes with the touch of my fingertips. I can burn through your flesh with a touch too, Tasselhoff. The candor closed his eyes for a moment and began to talk. His entire body quivering with the remembered terror. The abyss dropped away beneath us, and then, like I said, I I, I saw shadows. Those shadows were her eyes, Raisin, and the hills and valleys were her nose and mouth. We were rising up out of her face. She looked at me with eyes that gleamed with fire, and she opened her mouth, and I thought she was going to swallow us. But we only rose higher and higher, and she fell away beneath us, swirling. And then she looked at me, and she said, "She said, what did she say? The message was to me. It must have been. What did the Dark Queen say? She said, come home." Raceland's face went ashen. As the Kender watched in astonishment, Raceland seemed to shrivel up. When he rose to his feet, the mage's entire body shook. Raceland, you look awfully queer. Staggering backward, Raceland fell against the stone wall, his breathing rapid and shallow. Then, with a low, hollow cry of rage and anguish, he lurched forward and fled through the open door. The dewer on guard took one look at the mage's cadaver's face as Raceland ran blindly past him. And with a wild shriek, dashed off in the opposite direction. So amazing was all this that it took Tass a few moments to realize he wasn't a prisoner any more. The Kender put his hand on his forehead. Crescenia was right. I do feel better now that I've gotten that off my mind. It didn't do much for Raislin, though. Gee, look at that! On the floor across the room from him was the magical device. Tass managed to stagger over to it and slip it inside one of his pouches. Raislin must have dropped it out of his pocket. Well, now I've got to find Caramon and tell him I've got the magical device, and we can go home. The Kender, though still somewhat wobbly, managed to make his way across the dark room toward the torch-lit corridor. He peeped cautiously up and down the hall, but no one was in sight. I wonder where I am. Tass made his way down the corridor toward the staircase. Rounding the corner, he confronted two dewer guards. Who appeared considerably startled to see him. Hello, my name is Tasselhoff Burfoot. He extended his hand. The dewer, regarding the Kender with looks of alarm, shouted one word, turned, and bolted. Plague? Hmm. They must think I've still got it. Hmm. That's handy. Or is it? Puffing along, feeling a bit dizzy but determined to find Caramon, Tass climbed the stairs after the dewer. As he rounded a corner, he came to a sudden halt. Oops! A whole dewer army. Tass ducked back behind the corner, taking a closer look. Though, he saw that some of the dwarves weren't dewer at all, but mountain dwarves. Hey! From what Raislin said, they're the enemy. One of the mountain dwarves began talking to the leader of the dewer. Argot, 
We came here to get the head of this General Keramon. You have said that the wizard promised it would be arranged. But if it is, we can dispense with the wizard. I'd just as soon not deal with a black robe anyway. And now, answer me this, Argot. Are your people ready to attack the army from within? Are you prepared to kill this general? Or was this just a trick? If so, you will find it will go hard with your people back in Thorbarden. It no trick. We ready. The general is in the war room. Wizard said he makes sure him alone with just bodyguard. Our people get the hill dwarves to attack. When you keep your part bargain, when scouts give signal that great gates to Thorbarden are open, then... The signal is sounding even as we speak, Argot. If we were above ground, you could hear trumpets. The army rides forth. Then we go. We take General Keraman's head right now. I will join you, if only to make certain you plot no further treachery. Tass leaned back against the wall. His legs had gone all prickly, and there was a buzzing in his ears. Caramon, they're going to kill him. Suddenly, the Kenner's head snapped up. Tasselhoff Burfoot, what are you doing standing around? You promised Tika you'd take care of him. Tass pulled out his little knife and crept quietly, as only Kender can, down the corridor. Come home. Come home, mother. These were the words the boy Raislin had cried as he held his dying mother's hand. The woman had had magic in her blood, but the gift had drifted into spiritual planes only she could see. She had gone berserk following the death of her husband. In her grief, she let the magic control her, and thus finally she died. Now in the depths of the fortress of Zaman, Raislin heard the words again, but it was not his mother. It was the Dark Queen challenging him mocking him, daring him. He felt as if he were imprisoned within his own bell tower, the words ringing his doom. Clutching his head, he tried desperately to blot out the sound. Come home, come home. Dizzy and blinded by the pain, the maid searched for escape from his inner torment. His numb feet lost their footing. Tripping over the hem of his black robe, he fell to his knees. An object rolled out onto the stone floor. Seeing it, Raceland gasped in fear and anger. Another mark of his failure. The dragon orb, cracked, darkened, useless. Frantically he grabbed for it, but it skittered like a marble across the floor, eluding his clawing grasp. Desperate, he crawled after it until finally it rolled to a stop. With a snarl, Raceland started to take hold of it, then halted. Lifting his head, his eyes opened wide. He saw where he was, and he shrank back, trembling. Before him loomed the great portal. It was exactly like the one in the Tower of High Sorcery in Palanthus. A huge oval door, standing upon a raised dais, guarded by the heads of five dragons. The five heads faced inward, five mouths open, screaming a silent tribute to their queen. Wrenching his gaze from the portal, he turned his attention back to the dragon orb. How did it escape me, he wondered angrily. He kept the orb in a bag hidden deep within a secret pocket of his robes. But then he knew the answer. Each dragon orb was endowed with a strong sense of self-preservation. Now, sensing the greatest danger of its existence, it was trying to flee Raceland. He would not allow it. Reaching out, his hand closed firmly over the dragon orb. There was a shriek. The portal opened. Prostrate upon his knees, clutching the orb to his chest, Raceland felt the presence and the majesty of Takesis, queen of darkness, rise up before him. Awe-stricken, he cowered, trembling at the Dark Queen's feet. This is your doom, her words hissed in his mind. Your mother's fate will be your own. Swallowed by your magic, you will be held forever spellbound, without even the sweet consolation of death to end your suffering. Raceland collapsed. His body shriveled, his head resting on the stone floor as it rested upon the executioner's block of his nightmare. The mage was about to admit defeat. But there was a core of strength within Raceland. Long ago, Parsalian, head of the Order of White Robes, had been given a task by the gods. They needed a magic user strong enough to help defeat the growing evil of the Queen of Darkness. Parsalian had chosen Raceland. 
for he had seen within the young mage this inner core of strength. It had been a cold, shapeless mass of iron when Raislin was young, but Parsalian hoped that the white-hot fire of suffering, pain, war, and ambition would forge that mass into finest tempered steel. Raislin lifted his head from the cold stone. Sweat poured from his body as the heat of the queen's fury beat around him. She tormented him, mocked him with his own words and visions, and yet, even so, Raislin's soul began to exult. After an exertion that left him weak and shaking, he closed his eyes to his queen's mocking smile. Darkness surrounded him, and he saw, in the cool, sweet darkness, his queen's fear. She was afraid, afraid of him. Slowly, Raislin rose to his feet. Hot winds blew from the portal, billowing the black robes around him until he seemed enveloped in thunderclouds. He could look directly in. He regarded the dread door with a grim, twisted smile. Then, lifting his hand, Raislin hurled the dragon orb into the portal. Hitting that invisible wall, the orb shattered. Shadowy wings fluttered around the mage's head. Then, with a wail, the wings dissolved into smoke. Strength coursed through Raislin's body, strength such as he had never known. The knowledge of his enemy's weakness affected him like an intoxicating liquor. He felt the magic flow from his mind into his heart. The accumulated power of centuries of learning was his. And then he heard the clear clarion call of a trumpet. Pure and crisp, the trumpet call echoed in his mind, calling him into darkness, giving him a power over death itself. Raislin paused. He hadn't intended to enter the portal this soon. He would have liked to wait a little longer, but the Kenda's arrival meant time could be altered. The death of the gnome ensured there would be no interference from the magical device, the interference that had proved the death of Fistandantilus. The time had come. Raislin gave the portal a last lingering glance. Then, with a bow to his queen, he turned and strode purposefully away up the corridor. Chrysania knelt in prayer in her room, but a strange foreboding filled her heart. She stared at the stars, tracing the lines of the constellations. Gillian, the scales of balance. Tachesis, the queen of darkness. Paladine, the valiant warrior. Staring into the night, Chrysania's fingers grew cold. She realized she was shivering, and she turned around, telling herself it was time to sleep. But there was still that tremulous intake of breath about the night. Wait, it whispered. Wait. And then she heard the trumpet. Pure and crisp, its music pierced her heart, crying a paean of victory that thrilled her blood. At that moment, the door to her room burst open. Raislin stood silhouetted in the doorway, outlined against the light of torches blazing in the corridor. She had seen him in the ecstasy of his magic. She had seen him battling defeat and death. Now she saw him in the fullness of his strength, in the majesty of his dark power. Ancient wisdom and intelligence were etched into his face, a face that she barely recognized as his own. It is time, Chrysania. She took hold of his extended hands. I'm afraid. He drew her near. You have no need to be afraid. Your God is with you. I see that clearly. It is my goddess who is afraid, Chrysania. I sense her fear. Together, you and I will cross the borders of time and enter the realm of death. Together, we will battle the darkness. Together, we will bring Tachesis to her knees. His hands caught her close to his breast. His lips closed over hers, stealing her breath with his kiss. Chrysania let the magical fire consume her body, consume the frightened, white-robed shell she had been hiding in all these years. He drew back raising her chin so that she could look into his eyes. And there, reflected in the mirror of his soul, she saw herself glowing with a flaming aura of radiant white light. She saw herself bringing truth and justice to the world, banishing forever sorrow and fear and despair. Blessed be to Paladine. Blessed be, Raceland replied. Once again I give you a charm. You shall be guarded when we pass through the portal. Drawing her near, holding her close one last time, he pressed his lips upon her forehead. Pain shot through her body and seared her heart. She flinched, 
but did not cry out. He smiled at her. Come. On the whispered words of a winged spell, they left the room to the night. In the map room below, Karaman faced Garrick, his trusted lieutenant. The supply wagons? Karaman asked. No word, sir. Garrick avoided his gaze. They won't be coming, Garrick. They've been ambushed. You know that. At least we found water, sir. Ugh, my own sweat tastes better. Blasted stuff must be tainted by seawater. Still, sir, it's drinkable. Oh, well, Garrick, there won't be men enough left to drink it after a while. What's a desertion count today? About one hundred, sir. Where'd they go? Pax Darkus? Yes, sir, so we believe. What else, Garrick? You're keeping something back. Is it the Plainsman? Garrick looked down at the maps. They've gone, sir. Back to their homes. All of them, sir. Sighing softly, Caramon picked up one of the small wooden figures that had been spread out on the map to represent the placement of his troops. Rolling it around in his fingers, he grew thoughtful. Then suddenly, with a bitter curse, he turned and heaved the figurine into the fire. After a moment, he let his aching head sink into his hands. I don't blame them. It won't be easy for them even now. The mountain dwarves hold the passes behind us. May the gods go with them. Oh, damn my brother, damn him! Well, our only hope is to keep what's left of our army here in the plains. Got to draw the dwarves out, force them to fight in the open. We'll never win our way into the mountain. But at least we can retreat with the hope of winning back to Pax Tharkas with our forces still intact. Once there... General! One of the guards at the door entered the room. Begging your pardon, sir, but a messenger's arrived. Send him in. A young man entered the room. His cheeks red from the cold, he cast the blazing fire a longing glance, but stepped forward first to deliver his message. The hill dwarves are gone, sir. Gone? Gone where? Surely not back? They march on Thorbarden, and, sir, the knights went with them. That's insane! Caramon's fist crashed down upon the table. My brother? No, sir. It was apparently the dewer. I was instructed to give you this. Drawing a scroll from his pouch, he handed it to Caramon, who quickly opened it. General Caramon, I have just learned from dewer spies that the gates to the mountain will open when the trumpet sounds. We plan to steal a march on them. I am sorry there wasn't time to inform you of this. Rest assured, you will receive what share of the spoils you are due, even if you arrive late. May Reorx's light shine on your axes. Rieger Fireforge. Caramon's mind went back to the piece of blood-stained parchment he'd held in his hand not long ago. The wizard has betrayed you. Dewa! Dewa spies! Spies, all right, but not for us. Traitors, all right, but not to their own people. They helped us win at Pax Tharkas, only to lure us onward to our own destruction. It was a trap from the first, and we fell into it like a bunch of damn rabbits. Look at us! Our people deserting in droves, the plainsmen leaving, and now the hill dwarves marching to Thorbarden, the dewer marching with them. And when the trumpet sounds... Caramon started. Was he hearing it, or was it a dream? He could almost see the dewer, slowly, imperceptibly spreading out among the hill dwarves, infiltrating their ranks. Hand creeping to axe. Rieger's people would never know what hit them. Caramon could hear the shouts, the thudding of iron-shod boots, the clash of weapons, and the harsh, discordant cries. It was so very real. Lost in his vision, Caramon only dimly became aware of the sudden pallor of Garrick's face. Drawing his sword, the young knight sprang toward the door with a shout that jolted Caramon back to reality. Whirling, he saw a tide of dark dwarves surging outside the door. There was a flash of steel. Ambush! Garrick yelled. Fall back! Caramon thundered. Bolt the door! Everyone retreat! Caramon gripped the arm of one of the guards to drag him into the room, bringing his sword down upon the head of an attacking dewer at the same time. Shoving the guard behind him, Caramon hurled himself bodily at the horde of dark dwarves packed into the corridor, his sword slashing a bloody swath through them. General! Look out! Garrick stood in the doorway, his sword still in his hand. Turning, Caramon headed for the safety of the map room, but his foot slipped, and he fell, wrenching his knee. With a wild howl, the dewer leaped on him. Get inside! Bolt the... 
The rest of Kiraman's words were lost as he disappeared beneath a seething mass of dwarves. His left arm already broken, Kiraman twisted onto his side, smashing the hilt of his sword to the face of a dwarf. Then, in the return stroke, he thrust the blade through the gut of another. Garrick's charge spared his life, if only for an instant. Kiraman, above you! Rolling onto his back, Kiraman looked up to see Argot standing above him, his axe raised. Kiraman lifted his sword, but at that moment four dark dwarves leaped on him, pinning him to the floor. Garrick tried desperately to save Kiraman, but there were too many dwarves between him and his general. Already, the dewer's axe blade was falling, but it fell from nerveless hands. Garrick saw Argot's eyes open wide in astonishment. The dwarf's axe fell to the blood-slick stones with a ringing clatter as he toppled over on top of Caramon. Staring at Argot's corpse, Garrick saw a small knife sticking out of the back of the dwarf's neck. Seeing their leader dead, the remaining dewer began to flee, chased by Caramon's guards. Garrick looked up to see Argot's killer and gasped in astonishment. Standing over the dead traitor was, of all things, a kender. Tass, whispered Caramon, stunned. H Hello, Caramon. I, I, I'm awfully glad to see you again. I, I, I've got lots to tell you, and it's very important, and I really should tell you now, but I, I think I'm going to faint. And so that's it, Caramon. Raceland lied about how to work the magical device. When I tried, it came apart in my hands. I did get to see the fiery mountain fall, and that was almost worth all the trouble. I could forgive your brother for all that, but not for what he did to poor Nimsh, and what he tried to do to you. What did he try to do, Tass? I didn't suppose there was anything left he could do to me. Have you killed? Ah, yes. So that's what the dwarf's message meant. Caramon felt neither anger nor surprise. Then a great surge of longing for his home, for Tika, for his friends, rushed in to fill up that vast emptiness. As if reading his thoughts, Tass rested his small head on Caramon's shoulder. Can we go back to our own time now? I'm awfully tired. Say, do you think I could stay with you and Tika for a while? Just until I'm better. I wouldn't be a bother. His eyes dim with tears, Caramon put his arm around the kender and held him close. As long as you want, Tass. Tass's face grew alarmed. Oh, Lady Crisania. I tried to tell her about Raceland, but she doesn't believe me. We can't let him take her to that horrible place. We'll try to talk to her again, Tass. I don't think she'll listen, but we can at least try. They'll be at the portal now. Raceland can't wait much longer. The fortress will fall to the mountain dwarves soon. Garrick, feel like traveling? Of course, sir. Good. Actually, I guess you don't have much choice. This place will be overrun soon. You've got to get out now. What about you, sir? Aren't you coming with us? Let's just say that Kendra and I have a magical way home. Not your brother? No, not my brother. He has his life to live, and I finally see I have mine. Go to Pax Darkus. Use the underground tunnels. They'll be safer. You can get to them through the mounds out on the plains. Do what you can to help those who make it there safely survive the winter. That's in order, Sir Knight. Yes, sir. Garrick averted his face. Caramon put his arm around the young man. Paladine be with you, Garrick. May he be with all of you. Paladine, the god who deserted us. Don't lose your faith, Garrick. Even if you can't believe in the god, put your trust in your heart. Listen to its voice. And someday, you'll understand. Yes, sir. And may whatever gods you believe in be with you too, sir. I guess they have been, all my life. I've just been too damn thick-headed to listen. Raceland's moment was at last at hand, the moment for which he had endured the pain, the humiliation, the anguish of his life, the moment for which he had studied, fought, sacrificed, killed. He savored it, letting the power flow over him and through him. Nothing in this world existed for him now, save the portal and the magic. But even as he exulted in the moment, his mind was intent upon his work. Each of the five dragon heads surrounding the portal must be propitiated with the correct phrases in the proper order. But once that was done, and the white-robed cleric had exhorted Paladine to hold the portal open, they would enter. It would close behind them, 
And he would face his greatest challenge. The thought excited him. Looking at Crisania, he nodded. It was time. Like the holy night humor, she had been through her trials. Trials of fire, darkness, and blood. She was ready. Paladine, Platinum Dragon, your faithful servant comes before you and begs that you shed your blessing upon her. Her eyes are open to your light. Open this portal so that she may enter and go forward bearing your torch. Walk with her as she strives to banish the darkness forever. Graceland held his breath. All depended on this. Did she possess the strength, the wisdom, the faith? Was she truly Paladine's chosen? A pure and holy light began to glimmer from Crisania. Her dark hair shimmered. Her white robes shone like sunlit clouds. Thank you, God of light, she cried. Tears sparkled like stars upon her pale face. I will be worthy of you. Watching her, enchanted by her beauty, Graceland could only stare entranced. Then he exulted. Nothing could stop him now. Oh, Caravan, whispered Tasselhoff in awe. But to light pass. The two, having made their way through the dungeons to the very bottom level of the magical fortress, came to a sudden halt, their eyes on Crisania. Enveloped in a halo of silver light, she stood in the center of the portal, her arms outstretched, her face tilted to the heavens. Look, Tass, she's blind, just as blind as I was in the Tower of High Sorcery. She cannot see through the light. Tass clutched at him frantically. We can't let her go. It, it, it's my fault. I'm the one who told her about Boo-Poo, about how Raceland might be saved because of the kindness he'd shown Boo-Poo. Crisania might not have come if it hadn't been for me. I'll talk to her. The Kender leaped forward, waving his arms, but he was jerked back suddenly by Caramon, who caught hold of him by his tassel of hair. Tass yelped in protest, and, at the sound, Raceland turned. The archmage stared over at his twin and the Kender for an instant, without seeming to recognize them. Then recognition dawned in his eyes. It was not pleasant. Hush, Tass, Caramon whispered. It's not your fault. Now stay put. Caramon thrust the Kender behind a thick granite pillar. Stay there. Keep the device safe, and yourself too. Giving the Kender a final warning glance, Caramon limped down the corridor toward where his brother stood. Gripping the staff of Magius in his hand, Raceland watched him warily. So you survived. Thanks to the gods, not to you. Thanks to one god, my brother, the Queen of Darkness. She sent the Kender back here, and it was he, I presume, who altered time, allowing your life to be spared. Does it gall you, Caramon, to know you owe your life to the Dark Queen? Raceland's eyes flashed. He lifted his right hand and said, Black Dragon, from darkness to darkness, my voice echoes in the emptiness. As Raceland spoke, an aura of darkness began to form around Crisania, an aura of light as black as the night jewel. Raceland felt Caramon's hand close over his arm. Angrily, he tried to shake off his brother's grasp, but Caramon's grip was strong. Take us home, Raceland. Raceland turned in astonishment. What? Take us home. Raceland laughed contemptuously. You are such a fool, Caramon. You know I betrayed you. I would have left you for dead in this wretched place. And still you cling to me. I'm clinging to you because the waters are closing over your head, Raceland. My hand upon your arm. That's all we have. My eyes have been opened. I now see you for what you are. And yet you beg me to come with you. I could learn to live with the knowledge of what you are and what you have done. But you have to live with yourself, Raceland. That must be damn near unbearable. Think of this, though. You have done good in your life, Raceland. You helped even when you knew it was hopeless, thankless. There's still good you could do to make up for the evil. Leave this. Come home. Come home. Come home. The ache in Raceland's heart was almost unendurable. On the edges of reality, he could hear Crisania's soft voice praying to Paladine. The lovely white light flickered upon his eyelids. Come home. When Raceland spoke next, his voice was as soft as his touch. 
the dark crimes that stain my soul, brother, you cannot begin to imagine. If you knew, you would turn from me in horror and loathing. I committed those crimes willingly, Karaman. There are darker crimes before me, and I will commit them willingly. His gaze went to Crescenia. Yes, my brother, she will enter the abyss with me. She will go before me and fight my battles. She will face dark clerics, dark magic users, spirits of the dead, and the unbelievable torments that my queen can devise. All these will wound her in body, devour her mind, and shred her soul. Finally, when she can endure no more, she will slump to the ground to lie at my feet, bleeding, wretched, dying. She will, with her last strength, hold out her hand to me for comfort. All she will ask is that I stay with her as she dies. But I will walk past her, Karaman. I will walk past her without a look, without a word. Why? Because I will need her no longer. Half turning, he raised his left hand and said, White dragon, from this world to the next, my voice cries with life. Karaman's gaze was on the portal, on Crescenia, his mind swamped by revulsion. Still, he held on to his brother. Then he felt the thin arm between his hand make a sharp, twisting motion. There was a flash, and the gleaming blade of a silver dagger pressed against the flesh of his throat, right where his life's blood pulsed in his neck. Let go of me, my brother. And though he did not strike with the dagger, it drew blood anyway. Not from the flesh, but from the soul. Quickly and cleanly, it sliced through the last spiritual tie between the twins. Karaman winced slightly at the swift, sharp pain in his heart, but the pain did not endure. The tie was severed. Free at last, Karaman released his twin's arm without a word. Turning, he started back to where Tass waited, still hidden behind the pillar. One final hint of caution, my brother. Be wary of that magical time device. Her dark majesty repaired it. If you use it, you could find yourselves in a most unpleasant place. He's wrong, Karaman, Tass cried out from behind his pillar. Nymphs fixed it. Karaman walked back to the kinder. Doesn't matter now. Come on, Tass. Let's go home. Farewell, my brother. Graceland didn't hear. Facing the portal, he was once again lost in his magic. Let them go. Good riddance, Graceland thought. Finally, I am rid of that great hulking idiot. Raising his hand, facing the third dragon's head, Graceland recited its chant. Red dragon, from darkness to darkness I shout. Beneath my feet, all is made firm. Red lines shot from Crescenia's body through the white light, through the black aura. Red and burning as blood, they spanned the gap from Graceland to the portal, a bridge to beyond. Blue dragon, time that flows, hold in your course. Blue streams of light flowed over Crescenia, then began to swirl. As though floating in water, she leaned her head back, her arms extended. Grayson felt the portal shiver. The magical field was starting to activate and respond to his commands. His soul quivered in a joy that Crescenia shared. Her hands spread, and at her touch, the portal opened. Graceland's breath caught in his throat. The surge of power and ecstasy that coursed through his body nearly choked him. He could see through the portal now. He could see glimpses of the plane beyond, the plane forbidden to mortal men. From somewhere, dimly heard, came his brother's voice, activating the magical time device. Thy time is thy own, though across it you travel. Grasp firmly the beginning and the end. Destiny be over your head. Home. Come home, Graceland began the fifth chant. Green dragon, because by fate even the gods are cast down. Weep ye all with me. Graceland's voice faltered. Something was wrong. The magic pulsing through his body turned sluggish. Graceland stared frantically at the portal. The light around Crescenia was beginning to waver. Graceland could feel the magic slither from his grasp. He was losing control. Come home. His queen's voice, laughing, mocking. 
his brother's voice, pleading, sorrowful, and then another voice, a shrill Kender voice, only half heard. Now it flashed through his brain with a blinding light. Nims fixed it. As the dwarf's blade had penetrated Raceland's shrinking flesh, so now the words of Astinus's chronicles stabbed his soul. At the same instant, a gnome, being held prisoner by the dwarves of Thorbarden, activated a time-traveling device. The gnome's device interacted somehow with the delicate and powerful magical spells being woven by Vistendantilus. A blast occurred of such magnitude that the plains of Durgoth were utterly destroyed. Raceland clenched his fists in anger. Killing the gnome had been useless. The wretched creature tampered with the device before his death. History would repeat itself. Looking into the portal, Raceland saw the executioner step out from it. He saw his own hand lift his own black hood. He saw the flash of the axe blade descending, his own hands bringing it down upon his own neck. The dragon heads surrounding the portal shrieked in triumph. A spasm of pain and terror twisted Chrysania's face. Looking into her eyes, Raceland saw the same look he had seen in his mother's eyes as they stared into a far distant plain. Come home. Within the portal, the swirling lights began to whirl madly. They rose up around the limp body of the cleric. Chrysania cried out in pain. Tears ran from Raceland's eyes as he stared into the swirling vortex. And then he saw the portal was closing. Hurling his magical staff to the floor, Raceland unleashed his rage in a bitter, incoherent scream of fury. Out of the portal, in answer, came mocking laughter. Come home! <laughs> The calmness of despair stole over Raceland. He had failed, but she would never see him grovel. He lifted his head, using all of his great powers, powers he had no idea he possessed, powers that rose from somewhere dark. Raceland raised his arms, and his voice screamed out once again. But this time, he shouted words of command, words that had never been uttered before. This time, his words were heard and understood. The field held. He held it. He could feel himself holding it. At his command, the portal shivered and ceased to close. Raceland drew a shuddering breath. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw a flash. The magical time travel device had been activated. The field jumped and surged wildly. The device's vibrations caused the fortress itself to begin to sing. In a devastating wave, their songs surged around Raceland. The dragon's shrieking answered in anger. The ageless voices of the rocks and the timeless voices of the dragons combined in a discordant, mind-shattering cacophony. The earth shuddered, the rocks split open, the dragons' heads cracked. The portal itself began to crumble. Pain shot through Raceland's head. It was a terrible choice he faced. Let go, and he would fall to his doom, fall into a nothingness to which the most abject darkness was preferable. And yet, if he held it, he knew he would be ripped apart his body dismembered by the forces of magic he had generated and could no longer control. His muscles ripped from his bones, sinews shredding, tendons snapping. Karamon! Raceland moaned. But Karamon and Tass had vanished. The magical device, repaired by the one gnome whose inventions worked, had worked. They were gone. Raceland had seconds to live, moments to act. Yet the pain was so excruciating that he could not think. His joints were being wrested from their sockets, his eyes plucked from his face, his heart torn from his body, his brain sucked from his skull. He could hear himself screaming and he knew it was his death cry. Still, he fought as he had fought all his life. I will control. The words came from his mouth, stained with his blood. I will control. Reaching out, his hand closed over the staff of Magius. I will and then he was hurtling forward into a blinding, swirling, crashing wave of many-colored lights. Come home. Come home. Come home. Come home.
This has been a Random House Audiobooks presentation. We hope you have enjoyed this audio program. Look for the complete trilogy of the Dragonlance Legends, available on audio cassette from Random House.